Hey guys, Eric Bischoff here to talk to you about my friends over at SaveWithConrad.com. Are you looking to get out of debt? Conrad and his team can make that happen faster than me firing the hockey talk man. Wow. And you know that controversy creates cash, right? Do you know what doesn't create cash? Credit card debt. Save with Conrad can help you consolidate high interest credit cards and all of your other debt into one low monthly payment. They can even help you get the cash you need for home improvements or anything else. They've helped 83 weeks listeners save 500, 600, 700, even $800 a month. Seriously, your papers are going to go down faster than nitro ratings in 2000. Ouch! And how about this? No house payments for two months. That's right, no house payments for two months. And unlike the dirt sheets, man, the reviews do not lie. With over 1,000 five-star reviews, find out for yourself how much Conrad and his team can save you by checking out savewithconrad.com today. You'd be grateful you did. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Woo! Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to 83 Weeks. Hey there, kick off, Eric. What's going on, man? How are you? I'm doing great. Got a big weekend coming up. Going to be in Akron, Ohio, Saturday. So if you're a wrestling fan, you'll find me. Um, following week, I'm traveling to Baltimore. Going to have some fun. Then I'm going to be in, where am I going to be on? Oh, July 26th, I'm going to be at Line Cider Brewing. Ha, <laughs> I love that. Over in East Greenwich, Rhode Island, for best trivia ever. Best trivia ever is a blast. Come on over to Line Cider Brewing. Check us out. Got a busy August coming up, heading to the UK in September, heading to Wales in November. Let's get a look at that. Let's get another look at that best trivia ever graphic. It's kind of a cool graphic. I like that. Best Trivia Ever. You can get your tickets at uh, besttriviaever.com if you're in the East Greenwich, Rhode Island area. Check us out. We're going to have a blast. I'm uh, I'm excited about uh, all that you got going on. Of course, you're going to be over across the pond with our pal Kenny McIntosh, I think, as a part of Inside the Ropes. Uh, that's happening uh, towards the end of September. Uh, but before you get across the pond... You're going to be with our pal, Dan McDivitt, Maryland championship wrestling is doing their own big uh, shindig. It's happening this Sunday, the 23rd. Uh, so if you haven't already make plans to come see easy E uh, and I think your old pal, John Alba's going to be there. You guys are going to be doing a little strictly business for MCW and Dan, right? Yeah, that should be fun. I've never done a live strictly business. So I'm looking forward to the Q and a portion of that. Um, but yeah, no, and Baltimore, man, Baltimore's a fun wrestling town. Can't wait to oh, get hell, there. Hell yeah, it is. Uh, and of course, uh, we've got Starcast right around the corner. Of course, you know we can't do that without Easy E. Come check us out if you haven't made plans already. In Chicago, Labor Day weekend, Friday, September first, September second, and September third. We got lots of fun tricks up our sleeve. We'll start announcing this week on social media. Uh, but right now, you can go ahead and make the All Out Show a destination. We've got bracelet packages, which would allow you to see all the panels on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Of course, first crack at the meet and greets. And boy, do we have some surprises and special opportunities there. We're going to lead into some more interactive stuff like we did this year at Top Guy Weekend as well. But maybe the coolest part about going to starcast.com right now, you can lock in a hotel room where it all happens, meaning you don't have to leave. You just wake up, go downstairs, and ta-da, you're in wrestling fantasy land. And right now we have a bundle where you can get ringside seats for all out. That's right. You want second row seats. You want lower level. You want the best seat in the house. It's available now at starcast.com. Now that's S T A R R C A S T.com. No fantasy involved in this one today though, boy, we're going to talk about what actually happened with the invasion. Yeah. That invasion 22 years ago. It was every wrestling fan's dream. I'll never forget going to the grocery store with my mom when I was a kid. And they always had that newsstand section. So I was never disappointed that mom made me go unload the groceries. It meant I got to check out all the latest and greatest wrestling magazines. And inevitably, at least one of those magazines every single month or so it felt had some sort of fantasy booking on the outside. What if this guy wrestled this guy, whether it was stone cold versus Goldberg, whether it was sting versus the undertaker, 
even in the 80s, what if it was Hulk Hogan versus Ric Flair? And then it finally came to be, we were going to see it. And it happened, uh, of course, the big invasion pay-per-view happened in July of 2001. So Eric, if we had a, a baby the day of that pay-per-view, that dude would be 22 years old now. He could legally drink a beer with us. Where does the time go, man? But you know, you, you grow up all your life when you're a kid and you're a younger adult and you hear your parents or older friends, family members, and they all lament the fact that time, just, young man, you won't believe how, when you get to be my age, how fast time goes by. And you nod your head and, of course, be respectful. But in your mind, you just don't, there's no context. There's no relationship to that. You just nod your head and be polite and, you know, kind of feel a little sorry for people that feel that way. And here I am talking to you about something that happened 22 years ago, and I remember it like it was yesterday. It's really fascinating. It is fascinating. And I, I'm excited for us to talk about, you know, what did happen, what could have happened, what you would have done differently. Uh, we start, I guess, with uh, your attempt to purchase WCW. You wrote in your book that you reached out to Brad Siegel to purchase WCW, even when Vince Russo was in charge. And Siegel told you that AOL Time Warner would never sell the company. And man, in less than a month of that conversation, he calls you back and says, Hey, Eric, were you serious <laughs> about that? I mean, this, this all happened very, very quickly. Um, I know it's been a long time now. But is that the, the greatest what if for you of all? Like, what if you would have gotten a hold of WCW? I think it probably it, it has to be right because that who knows? Look, it could have been a disaster. It also could could have been one of the greatest things that uh, that happened to 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 me and my family and to WCW fans. So we'll never know. And and I guess because of that, I, I honestly don't think about that much, but. I think in this on this particular episode, we're going to be thinking, or I'm going to be thinking about a lot of things that I never really have given much thought to, and that that's what'll make this show fun. So, did you think it was something that you could run without AOL Tom Warner? Like the the attractiveness of the whole opportunity was the size of the network, whether it was TBS or TNT, and that there was a relationship or a contract in place. If you purchase the thing. Because just to add context, what I'm saying here, this is not the, the typical wrestling setup. Like Tony Khan, as we understand it, has a contract with Time Warner, but Tony owns AEW. Vince McMahon and shareholders own WWE, and they have a contract with USA and a contract with Fox. WCW, of course, is owned by Ted Turner. So it's it's all a part of this television company. I guess the question is, with without AOL, without Time Warner, is there any interest in doing anything with the WCW brand? I mean, all of a sudden, that's a totally different conversation, right? Yeah, and, and total, totally different conversation and totally different circumstances. I had, and we just we discussed this in the past, but um, when, and you're right, you know, I had spoken to Brad and said, man, you, if I were you, Brad, I would sell this thing while it still has value. And of course, Brad Siegel kind of chuckled and he said, Eric, this is Turner. You know, we don't, we don't sell things. We buy things. Oh, okay, Brad, carry on. And uh, shortly thereafter, Brad called and said, Hey, well, you, maybe do you think you could? And we, uh, we did, I did. We were able to, with Brian Badal and his partner, Steve Greenberg of Fusion Media, is able to put together. When I say we, it's in terms of putting together the $67 million. I think Brian and Steve put in $5 million of their own money as seed money. Just when you're going out and you're pitching an investment like that, traditional sure. investors, even VC you know, types, they want to know that you've got skin in the game that you're not just trying to build this business using other people's money. They want to know that you've got some of your own in, in a, in a meaningful amount as well. And that's where Steve and Brian, you know, put in 5 million of their own just to add credibility to, to the, to the business opportunity. Um, but because of the time period to answer your question, I'm just trying to give it context Yeah. to, to in order to make that deal happen, for that acquisition with Turner during those early discussions, we it, it was important. It, it was 
critical that we were able to close that deal fairly quickly. We didn't have a year or two to try to figure it out. We had to move quickly. We had to get, we had to get the money quickly had to have everything in place pretty quickly because that's what Turner wanted, right? We didn't want right. it to go out on the open market necessarily. So we moved very quickly. Now, prior to moving forward with that deal, after a letter of intent was signed and everything else, I did have conversations with uh, FX, which at the time was a part of the Fox portfolio. It was run by Peter Liguri and Kevin Riley. And I had had some initial conversations. The hookup or the or the hook, the, the the catch in those conversations is Brad Siegel wanted to include in in whatever transaction we put together with FX and Fox, Brad Siegel wanted to include second run rights for Buffy the Vamp Vampire Slayer. That was a part of the deal that Brad wanted. That deal was never going to happen, or if it would have happened or could have happened, it would have taken a year and a half to negotiate. That That's a complex deal with a lot of third parties involved. It, it, it's not just like selling a car on eBay, you know, it, it's very complex. So even though we had an initial conversation, it, it wasn't going to work out. So to be specific to your question, Turner was the only option we had because of the time constraints, uh, that was the only logical play. And it was a part of the deal. And we wouldn't have done the deal without the rights to Nitro on Monday nights, uh, Thursday on TBS. We would not have done the deal without it. I know we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but I am curious. Do you recall how you guys arrived at a $67 million number? I mean, that's the number we kept hearing. Do you know how you landed on that number? No, because I wasn't part of the team that put the valuation or the, you know, or the details of the money raised together. Keep in mind of that $67 million that we raised, some of that was operating capital. So the actual purchase price, I couldn't tell you. That's a Brian Badal question, but we raised a total of 67 million, but keep in mind, we have included a lot of operating costs and expenses. Right. So let's talk a little bit about another name that doesn't get talked about a ton, but we have heard the name Stu Snyder and the role perhaps he played in the WWF's purchase of WCW. Do you know what went on there? I don't. And that's one of the, uh, it's one of the most interesting facets of all of this, which by the way, I didn't really know about until I read guy, guy Evans book. Yeah. Uh, Nitro, the, the incredible rise and inevitable fall of Ted Turner's WCW. It's a fantastic book. And, and, and guy did so much research. And one of the people that, that guy Evans interviewed, I believe he interviewed Sue Snyder himself. Um, I, I think that's one of the sketchiest aspects. I said, most interesting. I, I, I didn't want to say sketchy, but I think it's sketchy as fuck. I, uh, I think for adfreeshows.com one day, I got to, uh, I got to get Stu on the record to talk about all this. I actually, um, became acquainted with Stu Snyder this year. So cross your fingers. Let's How did you become you acquainted with Stu Snyder? I'll tell you all fair. Uh, <laughs> it was, a, it, I can't it, wait. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that conversation, you know, when there's lights, camera action. Yeah. Let's, let's give it, some, let's give it some backdrop. Now this is all, you know, my interpretation and, and what I absorbed from reading guy Evans book, but right. Stu Snyder for people that have not heard that name before was an executive in Turner broadcasting. I believe Stu was the head of Turner home video. It was either Turner home video or Turner international. In either case, he was Turner exec, not affiliated directly with WCW. But somehow he found himself in the middle of negotiating this deal with WWE for the acquisition of WCW after the fusion deal and opportunity fell apart. Then the conversations became between Turner and WWE. How and why Stu Snyder found himself in that brokerage position 
with regard to WCW and, and negotiating with WWE is a fascinating question to me. It doesn't make any sense on the surface. Now, there may have been really valid reasons for it that I just can't imagine, but to have a guy that's, you know, basically oversees your home video division all of a sudden brokering a deal for wrestling uh, for the sale of, of, a, of a property like that. And, and as odd as that may be, at least it is to me, what's even weirder is immediately thereafter, Stu Snyder finds himself in the employee of WWE. Pretty cushy uh, job, too. Yeah, you think? Now, I don't know. Cool. Conrad, you know, you and I think a lot alike. You're, you're, you're a brilliant guy. You're smarter than I am. And you think, you, you think, and people talk about three dimensional thought processes. You've got a fourth, maybe even a fifth <laughs> year that a lot of people don't have. But on the surface, isn't that kind of kooky? Well, it's worth mentioning too. Um, all Stu didn't take just any job with WWE. How's, how's president sound? You want to come yeah. in and be president and COO? Yeah. Does that he's make sense going, to you? He, he's going to actually be the guy. Uh, I think you had uh, a, a little a little of it maybe backwards. There, he he went. He was a fraternity brother with a guy inside the Turner organization. Stu is the guy who actually makes this deal happen on the WWF side. Now he did eventually go work for Turner. Uh, he was there for like nine years. Uh, but that didn't happen until 07, but Stu is, is captaining the ship of the WWF at the time and sees an opportunity to, or maybe his old college buddy saw an opportunity and said, Hey, my frat brother here, he runs the biggest rival. Why don't I just see if maybe they want to do a deal? Uh, and, and to hear Jerry McDivitt tell it, as he told it at a live show with Bruce and I in Pittsburgh years ago, the same money that Turner had to pay. WWE to settle the lawsuit about the, the likeness of razor Ramon and Kevin Nash. They just turned around and wrote a check back to just buy the all, all of WCW. So it's a fascinating story. I can't wait to talk about it in long form sometime. Uh, but yeah, we're going to have some fun with that. So I, I want to make I, sure I, I got this. I want to make sure I got this straight Connor, because this will drive me batshit all day long. If I don't get it clear. So you're saying Stu Snyder was president of WWF prior to the acquisition? He was he was president in 2000 and 2001. When did he leave? When when was he? Because I remember Stu Snyder and Turner the day I got there in 1991. Really? So, am I confused? I'm not sure. I know he was running. Uh, I mean, even if you pull up old Stu's uh, LinkedIn, he's got his timeline up there. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to do that. That'll keep me from going batshit. By the way, somebody just asked uh, where they can get the book, and that's available on Amazon. Let me see. who. Oh, there it is. Aaron Sheen. Aaron, uh, go to uh, Amazon. WCW Nitro, The Incredible Rise. You'll find it. It is a fascinating book, probably the most detailed book you'll ever find on WCW. Uh, of course, Guy Evans had a second act in the wrestling book section, and that's Grateful, also available on Amazon. The Eric Bischoff story sort of picks up where he left off after controversy creates cash. Uh, so listen, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the way this thing all shakes out. We understand it's going to essentially become, I mean, when you really think about what you were buying, if you remove the television deal from the equation, it doesn't nearly have the same value to you, but there is the tape library and I know neither you nor I are in that business. Uh, but boy, that has become a valuable property. And just to add context, WWE made a bunch of money on this long before the network was even a thing. Because remember now they made this purchase in 2001. Think about all those DVDs, the rise and fall of WCW, the best moments of nitro, blah, blah, blah. So they crank out all that stuff for years and years and years. But on some level, the, the real value, the long-term value of WCW in this, this sale without the TV, it's gotta be the tape library, right? It's not the rings. It's not a handful of title belts or whatever it is. It's the tape library and, and, and the folks you were working with, uh, who had made their money essentially doing 
a licensing deal or, or purchasing old tape libraries of old, of old sports games and then selling it to ESPN, they saw that maybe before a lot of other people. Still, I think most people assume or know WWE got this deal of a lifetime just for the tape library. What would you value that WCW tape library at today in 2023 dollars, knowing what we know now? Oh God, I don't know God, because I'm not in that business. So I have, I have no idea, but I, I can only imagine it's a multiple of what it was valued at at the time of the acquisition, because keep in mind, you know, streaming wasn't a thing, right? The only thing was DVD sales and WCW, even during our peak made very, very little money on home video. Whoever was in charge of it. It was one of those, it was, it's one of the downsides of being a part of a big conglomerate like Turner broadcasting, or at least it was for WCW at the time where you're really totally dependent, not a hundred percent, you're about 80% dependent on, in our case, the Turner home video division, because they had all of the rights exclusively. And they were the ones that theoretically, at least on paper, were out shopping it. Unfortunately for WCW, you know, we were at the very bottom of the bag that people would bring in to display their products, you know? So when we had somebody from Turner Home Video Sales go out making calls, the last thing that they're going to, you know, they're going to pitch things that are part of the MGM film library, you know, whatever is the hottest is the things that they're going to try hardest to sell because that's where you're going to make the largest amount of your money. And in the eyes of a lot of, you know, Turner executives, WCW, first of all, they didn't even want to pull it out of the bag. If somebody would have asked about, hey, I understand you guys carry WCW. Do you have any DVDs, you know, for WCW? Then, you know, the, the salesperson would probably be excited to talk about WCW, but unless asked, it was the last thing any of the sales team at Turner wanted to talk about, whether it was ad sales or home video. Now that changed about 97, but by that time, you know, we'd already missed a great deal of opportunity because you've got to have your deals in place, your, 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 your production, your inventory, your distribution, you got to have all of that in place before you start making any money. So we never really made, we made nickels and dimes off of our, our home video products. So we, I say we, I, I don't think that fusion had a lot of, they didn't put a lot of value in it. You know, college sports is a little bit different than professional wrestling. I think it's a little easier for a mainstream media person in the, in the media, uh, entrepreneurs to see the potential value in legacy mainstream sports. But I don't think anybody really saw on the horizon any real value in professional wrestling legacy content. So I, I, I don't think they put too high value on it. It's amazing how, and this is something that doesn't get talked about because I think when a lot of people hear what you just said, Eric, about well, you know, when these Turner home video executives would go out and make a pitch, we were the last thing they would pitch. We were at the bottom of the bag. I think a lot of people hear that who listen to this program and they say, well, I would have pitched it, blah, blah, blah. Something worth mentioning that I don't think it's talked about enough. And I'm not trying to turn this into a controversial conversation. I'm just being honest. A lot of those media reps, a lot of those salespeople, they were women. And that doesn't get talked about a lot, but I've bought a ton of media in my life, radio, television, billboards, things like that. A lot of times I would say well over 50% of the time, the majority of the time, those are female salespeople, female salespeople sometimes have an easier time getting past the gatekeeper, getting to the decision maker. I don't know why that is. I just know that's the way it works. And I imagine that the, if, if you were a female salesperson, it would probably be near the bottom of the list of things that you would have confidence in selling professional wrestling. I understand it might be hot and blah, 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 but it's also something that at least in my household, it's always been, okay, I guess we have to watch wrestling. Never have I ever, uh, had a circumstance where the lady in my life said, Oh honey, can we watch wrestling tonight? It's a totally different thing. Uh, so people have the most confidence in selling what they believe and what they like and what they enjoy and what they that's what their comfort level is going to be. So I do think having, um, perhaps a largely female sales force 
is going to be something that affects the way wrestling is presented. And at the same time, we know that this attitude has always existed in wrestling. And, and obviously everyone listening to this has heard this type of conversation. Oh, you still watch that stuff. So if you were a male salesperson, then it's like, man, did this guy ever grow up? How does he not grow out of that? The wrestling's for kid. A, a lot of decision makers may have that attitude. So it's not this thing that you're loud and proud and out front with. Now, a lot of folks who are listening to this, they're, we, we think differently. We understand, Hey, that's closed minded thinking. Some of us have wrestling t-shirts and hell. I know a guy who walks around with a belt and hangs out in Bojangles for fun. Like I, th- I get that there are super fans. However, I just know that's not the norm. Uh, and it's not something in a, in a business conversation that you probably lead with. I don't want to say that shame is the right word. But it's not going to be the mantelpiece. Does that make sense, Eric? Well, it makes absolute sense. I never really thought about it like that. I, my experience, and kind of, I'd be curious to see what you think about this. Long before I got into professional wrestling, before I went to work for Burn, I was a sales manager for a food processor. No, I didn't sell meat door to door out of the back of a truck, but it made for a good promo. Thanks, Hulk. People still think that's true, by the way. I was, a, I was a, I was a sales manager for this food processor and I had a team of between 12 and 16 sales reps that I, and a lot of these sales reps came from other industries. I had sales, I, I hired salespeople from that had previously worked at sales at IBM, you know, and Cargill, Cargill was a big food manufacturer. Um, so I hired a lot of salespeople from different areas of business and with different levels of experience, some of them very, very seasoned and, and successful, some of them brand new, and I trained them. I trained all of them specifically to what our product and service, more, more than anything service was. And one of the things I learned, and, and I had a mentor, his name was Irv Mann, and Irv was one of those just you see you saw the movie tin man right i did that was Irv man he was just close i don't want to just close you know he he taught me so much and taught me how to close and taught me how to sell and really he was a phenomenal mentor but Irv man said something to me early on when he finally made me a sales manager because i was very successful there as a salesperson and even though I was the youngest person in the company at the time, Irv would never hire anybody younger than 50 years old. He just mm. didn't believe, he just didn't believe in it. And when he hired me, I was maybe all of 26. So I was, I guess an experiment or something, but we became very close and our families became close and friends. But so he mentored me a lot. And one of the things that he said is Eric, some of the greatest salespeople I know are some of the laziest people in the world. And that kind of confused me because I know it's hard work and you know, it's hard work. Anybody that's been in sales professionally for any length of time knows it is a grind like any other grind. But I, and I asked him, I said, why do you feel that? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Why are we hiring lazy people? He said, because lazy people will figure out the quickest way to make the most amount of money. Yes. And they'll, and they'll move on to the next deal. Now that kind of made sense to me. It's path of least resistance. So if you're a sales rep, male or female, a rep, yeah, representative from Turner Broadcasting, and you're out there pounding the pavement, so to speak, selling your Turner Broadcasting System library, are you going to reach into bag and sell the try to try to sell the toughest thing to sell? Are you going to reach into bag and sell the easiest thing to sell? That was a big part of it too. And again, keep in mind, and this is where the the context of timing gets a little you have to pay close attention to it, especially if you're listening to me, because I'm generally confused about it. But up until 1996, the culture within Turner Broadcasting as a whole was anti-wrestling. People hated it. Our peers in Turner at just about every level were embarrassed to one degree or another that WCW was a part of the Turner Broadcasting portfolio. So you not only have the situation as you described, where the individual out there, uh, particularly if it's a female that doesn't get wrestling, never watched wrestling, can't understand why people do. Yeah, there's going to be a natural reluctance to pull that out of your bag. 
Combine that with the fact that culturally within Turner Broadcasting, nobody would have blamed you for not wanting to pull it out of the bag. Everybody would have <laughs> sympathized with you. So we were fighting kind of a cultural issue as well as the issue that you just talked about. And the Irv Man factor, you know, it's just a lot harder to sell. At that time, things are different now. At that time, wrestling was kind of looked down upon by mainstream entertainment media. It was just a oh, tougher sell. Still, it's still looked down upon. I mean... It just is, you know, we, uh, the wife and I have settled into a new place, uh, down in Pensacola and right around the corner from us is this restaurant that's been given all these fabulous reviews and, and everybody's hyped it up to us. Oh, you got to go there. Uh, so we went and a huge wait. It was worth it. It was fantastic. Had a great time. Uh, and then a pal came to town and he said, Hey man, we've been here and we haven't had any good seafood. Where can we go? Okay. I got a place. We'll go over there. And you know what? We'll sit at the bar. And, uh, and we'll have them turn on, uh, TV. Cause it was, <laughs> it was AEW or if it was uh WWE, but there's nobody at the bar. Literally he and I are the only two people. And this older lady who was the bartender there, I said, Hey, uh, they had it on a random golf channel replay. Can we switch it to whatever it was Fox or TBS or whatever it was. And she goes, yeah. So she turns it on and then says, Oh, I'm not doing that. And changes it right back. And I'm like, wait, what, what was that? Yeah. I'm not showing that here. What? Why not? I'm not, wa we're not watching wrestling that that still exists. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was a, a, a subsequent conversation and it was fine, but that still exists. And I want to hear about the subsequent. I want to hear about the subsequent conversation, bro. You just glossed right over that. How did that go? Uh, we watched wrestling. Oh, no, this. man, I want deets. Come on. <laughs> well, the deal is it's like, you know, um, I'm in an awkward spot because the person I was having dinner with is a person who you and I work with, uh, on our podcast business. And you know, this was a, uh, an awkward spot that here I am in business with this person. This is how they make their living as well. We're going to, we're going to watch that. And, and we did. But it was, it was one of those things where it's like, if this is offensive to anyone, uh, if anyone comes up and is offended, I'm going to have to change the channel. And I was like, no, I understand. And so after there was this big interaction back and forth, uh, the other bartender, also a lady comes over and says, I just can't believe y'all still watch this stuff. Both of these women are in their fifties, by the way. And then a few minutes later, one of the, the staff members, I, either a bus boy or server or somebody like that. Is hustling by the bar, comes to a dead stop, and he says, Oh, I remember what it was now. He goes, Oh my God, AEW Dynamite. He was so excited. And I said, Well, don't get too excited, brother, because if anybody complains, we're going to have to change the channel. So it went the total opposite direction of where she was expecting. She thought having some random replay of a golf tournament two months before was perhaps more of what this crowd would want to see. When in fact, there was no crowd, there's no one here. It's a Wednesday night. Now that makes sense. Cause I was like, why would the bar be empty on a Friday night? It's a Wednesday night, but dude, I had multiple people go by and say, wow, AEW's on TV. It's like, it's not this niche thing that people imagine it is, but it is not the, the, the apple of the eye of a certain segment of Americans and those typically would be buyers or certainly sellers in the, in the ad market. And just to give another example of salespeople in that world being for lack of a better word, lazy, I, I appreciate that you use the word. I might've picked a different one, but I think that a lot of people just, they become order takers, the path of least resistance. So whenever, uh, someone was coming into my office to sell me advertising, they would always want to pitch whatever the newest, hottest thing was. I'll never forget when walking dead first got hot, they wanted to come in and tell me why I needed to advertise for mortgages during walking dead. And I said, well, well, why would I, why would I want to advertise inside of walking dead? Well, because everybody's watching it. Yeah. But not everybody is my customer. You've got a lot of teenagers and kids and I, I needed to target, you know, when people talk about, cause we have this conversation a lot in wrestling, but I don't think a lot of our listeners really understand. When they say, oh, the rating in the demo, man, do you realize how loosey goosey those words are? 
because if we're talking about the demo, do you know how many times somebody ever pitched me anything in media and said, we're 17th in the demo? Never. They would always come in and say, we're number one in the demo. Now, if you had to drill down, you might find out, well, the demo is women 18 to 34 who were single and have cats who go to sleep at nine o'clock at night. That's our number one in the demo. There's a, there's a difference between number one in the demo, you know, tw adults, 12 plus and, and, and all adults and, uh, women and men and this age group and that subset and who were, who were streaming and everyone always positions themselves as being number one. But as an advertiser, I knew even back then, I don't need everybody to hear about this opportunity for the mortgage. I need a certain section, a certain demographic, if you will, to, to understand what my offering is. I'm saying all that to say the people who were buying that, and more importantly, the people who were selling that, that being wrestling, they believed that wrestling was as niche as it gets. And I think that's the reason that there was some apprehension inside the Turner organization because well, everyone watches CNN who doesn't love baseball. Everyone loves baseball. It's America's pastime. Meanwhile, there's this stuff that your son watches when he's five to 12 years old and then he grows out of it. I think that was probably the attitude. Like this is such a silly niche thing. It's like, okay, your kid ages out of Barney and he gets into Hulk Hogan. That's the way I believe it was probably presented a lot of times, Eric. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting about your, and I'm going back to your story and I'm, I'm going to make a couple of assumptions here, but I bet money I'm right on a couple of them. Um, I would imagine knowing where you were in pet or where you are, where your home is in Pensacola, Florida. If you found a nice little restaurant, something suggests to me that the people around you, your neighbors, your community are fairly upscale, wealthy people that you would typically see sitting in the lounge of a private country club. Am I correct, sir? Well, here's the thing on that. You know, I, I live on the beach there, so there's a new set of neighbors every seven days. So this is a vacation town. People are in town to spend money. Uh, but yeah, to rent a house on the beach or a condo on the beach there, that's a pretty it's, it's a good size investment. Yeah. So you, you, it's, right. so it's an affluent transient environment. You've got a lot of people coming out, but I would bet that those people have a lot of money and the type of people, if you want to create a demo here for this conversation, probably yes. 45 to 65, probably in the mid to high six figure category, well to do people that you would expect to see in a lounge in a country club. Fair. Fair. All Fair. right. So th that bartender in that restaurant, it was probably a nice upscale restaurant. Um, that bartender is used to serving the type of people that you would typically see at a country club. Yes. And she, and in her mind, she's thinking, well, though my customers will never want to watch wrestling. Right. What she doesn't know is something that you and I and Dave Green and a lot of us that are involved in your little podcast, your big podcast empire, is once you get to know who your audience is, I, I, from my own experience, I've, I like to make random calls, you know, once a month or so to add free shows, family members, just to surprise them and get to know them and all that. You, I can't tell you how many times that I've talked to people. Oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a lawyer and I, I argue cases before the Supreme Court. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a rocket scientist and I'm experimenting with a new launch in Southern California. And I mean, you, the, 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 the amazing thing that I've experienced is being a part of your team is that, and I've been in the business, I had been in the business for 32 years before I ever stepped in front of a microphone for a podcast. Even I was shocked at the amount of people that no one would ever suspect watch professional wrestling. And I was waiting for you as you're telling your story, instead of the, you know, somebody coming out from the back and going, Hey, AEW dynamite. I was expecting guys come in with their polos and their trophy wives and their rope. No, no offense. Rolexes and all that. And sit down and go, Oh, I can't wait. Wrestling's on because that wouldn't surprise me either, by the way. All right. But it's people, uh, but people think they know what the wrestling people that are perhaps in the media business, 
think they know what the wrestling audience is, but until they do a deep dive, they don't have a clue and they would be shocked. But that wasn't the case back when Stu Snyder and company were selling WCW. I mean this disrespectfully. I know how that, I mean, respectfully, I know, I don't mean any disrespect when I say this, but I know, and I know how this sounds, but the thing is the lady had a preconceived notion of what quote unquote, her clientele wanted to see when in fact she was not a member of her clientele, but she had a preconceived notion of what they wanted to see. She wouldn't, she wasn't watching the golf channel. And by the way, there was no one in the bar. Again, I want to repeat, it was me and one other guy, the guy I brought with me, uh, later we were joined by another fellow, uh, who was exactly in the demo you described and he watched very intently. He didn't comment, but he didn't look away. He wanted to know what was going on. And inevitably that happens at my favorite watering hole down here in Huntsville. You've been to the boot before you've seen there's four TVs behind the bar. And Dre knows whenever I'm there, Hey, if it's Monday or Wednesday or Friday, switch it over one of the four TVs to wrestling. Inevitably, no one's watching the other three TVs and they're all making conversation about what they see on the wrestling show. Some are good. Some are bad, but no one's made a comment about what's on the other three TVs at all. No, it's, it's background just, noise. People put it up there. So if you come in with your wife and you really don't want to talk to your wife and you two have been bitching at each other all day long, but now you're hungry because you've worked up an appetite bitching at each other all day long, you really don't want to be in each other's company, but you've got no choice. So you go out to yeah. dinner, you sit at the bar, and there's something up there. Usually the sound's turned down, which makes sense if you're at a bar, and you're just staring. You're just staring at the television so you don't have to talk to the person yes. that you came with. It's background noise. It's a distraction. That's the only reason. People don't go to a bar to watch TV unless it's a game or an event or yes. something like that. If you're just casually going out for a bite to eat, you don't give up. But what's on TV normally? You know, it's a pet, it brings up a pet peeve. This has nothing to do with anything we're talking about. But my kratom's kicking in and the caffeine's starting to kick in. So I love you just it. Have to bear with me. Strap in, mucker fathers. Here we go. Um, when I go into a bar or a restaurant, and it's similar to what you just described. Oh, man, this Kratom is kicking in. It's similar environment to what you described. It's very slow. There's very few, if any, customers in there. And I walk in, and the bartender or the, the manager has this music cranked up that I'm sure is really great You know, at a club, like techno rock, whatever it's called, techno, I mean, just blaring. It's like, if you own a restaurant, people take, take some advice from this conversation. If there's anybody out there in the ad free shows world or outside of the ad free shows family, if you own a restaurant or you manage a restaurant restaurant program, your music for your customer, not for the 18 year old washing ditches in the back. It just pisses me off. And I've walked out of restaurants for that very reason. Or you walk in and it doesn't matter. If I, you know, I'm the first one in a restaurant and the music's blaring, everybody's prepping, getting ready for it. Cool, I get that. I used to work in a restaurant. I washed dishes. I was a cook. I get it. But once you open up and now you're expecting to bring people in, play the music that your demo likely would want to hear, something kind of middle of the road. Yes. Don't assume because you like something, or in this case, don't like something, that your customers are going to feel the same way you feel. That's a, that's a big mistake. It's a big mistake. If you're a television producer, don't write and create to entertain yourself or to appeal to the, or, or to satisfy the things that you individually are interested in. It's a lesson I learned from Ted Turner, produce television, create television for the masses. Yes, you need to scratch some itches along the way, but you want the biggest, broadest audience you can if you want to be successful. Just like if you're managing a restaurant, you want the biggest, broadest section of audience you can to come in and, and, and eat in your restaurant. Don't play music designed for an 18-year-old techno-pop freak. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So listen, we've got on our soapbox, we understand now that uh, wrestling is, is a much bigger opportunity than maybe people give it credit for but maybe not within the Turner organization. This is something that people, uh, have decided is less than, and, and they're going to offload it. And we know that that's how it goes. You know, they wind up getting a, a steal Vince McMahon and WWE, 
and we see the raw nitro simulcast, which is still one of the craziest things in the history of pro wrestling. March 26, 2001, there for a minute, you're seeing WWE programming on a Turner network on WCW Monday Nitro. I know we've covered that episode before, but as a reminder, did you watch that episode live? No, I didn't. It's got to be I weird. Haven't even seen, I haven't even seen, I don't think I've seen the entire episode. We may have covered it. I don't, I don't, I don't recall seeing the show though. I wasn't a watch it if I remember correctly. It's funny because, uh, I saw uh, a friend of ours the other day post uh, on social media that he found a ticket from that show in Panama city and sent it off and got it slabbed and, and, and graded and all that sort of thing. And I think, you know what, that was a cool collectible to have, but that's kind of from a bygone era because long gone are the days of needing paper tickets. Now all you need is game time. And you can actually make it a game time decision. Have you heard that before, right? A game time decision. That means it's last minute. You can do this last minute. That is a big deal. And I just want to reiterate. There's a lot of times when something's happening and you're too busy, right? Life gets in the way you miss it. Uh, so like, I'm not necessarily a huge jelly roll fan, but uh, man, he is blown up here in the South. He's right. I'm a huge place. jelly roll fan. I'll, his music is and his story is awesome. Sorry, didn't mean to throw you off. You know what's funny? You know, uh, my buddy Brad in Nashville that you've met before, my crazy sure. friend, he's like really good friends with Jelly Roll. And he's been trying to put me on Jelly Roll for like 10 years. And uh, we just never actually crossed paths or anything. And now he's like the number one artist around. So he's coming to Huntsville and the tickets are completely sold out. I know how I can get tickets though. Game time. You don't have to be at the front of the line, you don't have to know the on sale date. Don't stress out. Game time's got you covered in more ways than one. Yes. They can get you tickets to events the same day as the event. You hear me the same day as the event, it's not just concerts. It's not just wrestling, football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater. If it's a ticketed event, game time can hook you up and you don't have to plan months in advance. You can do it the same day as the event. They got you covered and all that, but here's my favorite two pieces of business about game time. Number one, they eliminate the risk of, is this a good seat? I can't tell you how many times I've taken a look at a seat map and said, oh man, that'll be a fantastic seat. I want to be in this section. And then I get there and it sucks. It is not the view I thought it was. I'm disappointed. I can make sure that I mitigate my risk of disappointment because game time has a seat view option. So you take a look and you can see, all right, this is what it will look like. Now, obviously it's a, it's a graphic, but you get the idea. Okay. Here's where everything's going to be. Boom. That is a great view. I want that ticket. I love game time for that, but I love this. The most of all the game time guarantee. You see, I want to know the peace of mind. I want the peace of mind of knowing I got a good deal. You may have figured that out for me by listening to the show. I want a good deal. Well, here's their guarantee. If you find tickets in the same section and the same row for less money, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Think about that. 110% of the difference coming back to you because you found tickets somewhere else cheaper. It won't happen. Game time guarantees it. And it just doesn't get it easy, any easier than this. It's literally two clicks, two taps, and you're all set. They do it right on your phone. It's an, it's the game time app. I want that one. Yep. I'll pay for it. Bam. I've got the tickets on my phone. I don't even have to dig through my email. So snag the tickets without the stress using game time, download the game time app, create an account and use the code weeks for $20 off your first purchase terms apply again, create an account and redeem the code weeks for $20 off download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So Eric, let's talk about, uh, you know, we know now that that Vince has his arms around the thing. He's closed the deal. He's on freaking nitro. He's plugging WrestleMania. Uh, what a great time to be alive for him. You don't even have the stomach to watch it live. I understand, but I can't help, but wonder what if when he had to go to Vince McMahon in September, or he had to go to Bret Hart in September of 1997 and say, I can't honor your contract. We're hemorrhaging cash. WCW's kicking our ass. See if you can get that old deal back. If he had not been able to secure Mike Tyson and the ball never really turned the other way and the momentum that WCW had just 
devastated WWE. Do you think there was a scenario in late 97, perhaps early 98, if none of that Tyson and Austin McMahon thing took off, that Ted would have tried to make a play to actually purchase WWE? Oh, I, I think he would have wanted to. And I think he would have if that opportunity existed. Um, I, I have, you know, honestly, I clearly haven't talked to Ted about this or never did talk to Ted about it. But absolutely, knowing Ted's appetite for acquisitions and love for wrestling, had there been an opportunity to purchase WWE, I have no doubt that Ted would have been all over it, particularly in 97 and 98 when WCW validated Ted's belief that it could be a substantial part of the portfolio and a profitable division in and of itself. So let's talk about if that would have happened hypothetically, if, if the worm turns, as we like to say, and it goes the other way and, and you're purchasing WWE, it would have been a totally different look and feel and probably opportunity for an invasion angle. And let's examine why, as I understand it, the WWF in an attempt to not upset their own salary structure, which we'll talk about in a minute. They only purchased the contracts of Lance storm, Chuck Palumbo, Sean O'Hare, Mark Jindrak, Mike awesome, Elix Skipper, Shane Helms, Shannon Moore, Stacy Keebler, Chavo Guerrero, Mike Sanders, Hugh Morris, Sean Stasiak, Kaz Hayashi, uh, Mr. Yang and, and Billy Kidman. So we would see a lot of these talents, as you see there, that's actually a shot. Even though it says Monday Nitro, uh, those are actually wrestlers inside the Astrodome there in, uh, in Houston for WrestleMania 17. Now the, the line, the language I want to be careful with here is as to not upset the salary structure as a reminder, Vince is not doing the huge money guarantees that WCW is now. Can I ask you, can I ask you, Conrad, I don't mean to interrupt, but when did my understanding is, I I don't have a clear understanding. That's why I'm asking a question. Do you know when Vince started making downside guarantees? Well, there's been a lot of debate about that. Of course, uh, Hall and Nash have always said that, that they, they helped bring that to the forefront and make that a thing for Vince. I have always been of the opinion that downside guarantees really started with like Lex Luger and the road warriors and Jim Crockett promotions. But certainly, uh, I, I believe Mark Merrow is the first person to get a, a, a downside guarantee. Now that might not be factual, but that's certainly the way it's been discussed with Mick Foley and I on his podcast, Foley is pod, because if you recall, Steve Austin and Mick Foley and, and Mark Merrow all started around the same time, not the exact same time, but within a handful of months. And during that time. Austin and Foley came in on the typical WWE so-and-so dates for so-and-so amount of money. I mean, we're talking like $150 for eight TV tapings or some such silliness versus Mero comes in on a several hundred thousand dollar guarantee. I don't have it in front of me. Maybe it's three or $400,000, whatever it is. He got some sort of a guarantee that Austin and Foley did not. And Foley has been pretty upfront about saying, he had a lot of animosity and professional jealousy towards Mark Merrow thinking, how is that guy worth more? The reality is Merrow had more leverage. Merrow was leaving a WCW contract to go get a WWF contract. Candidly, Cactus was already out of WCW as was Austin. So they didn't have the leverage that Merrow did, but my understanding is at this point. So we'll call it March of 2001. The top end, the most anybody could get on a downside guarantee from Vince McMahon was $1 million. So folks like stone cold and the rock and the undertaker and triple H they're on a million dollar a year downside. Can I, and again, to interrupt you, yeah. what I was most curious about is when D- WWE and I, I realized that we're guaranteed contracts, probably in NWA with Lex Luger, as you pointed out, yeah. certainly in WCW, I everybody that was working in WCW when I got there was on a guaranteed contract. Right. But I was curious as to when was the first time and who was the first person where Vince broke his typical, uh, revenue sharing model 
and offered downside guarantees. And it sounds like Merrill might've been the first, right? I think that's probably March or uh, April, probably March of 1996, Mark Merrill. Okay. Interesting. Is that, is that, does that surprise you? Uh, no, it doesn't surprise me at all. Um, you know, I know, I know Paul White, when Paul White left WCW, whenever that was, uh, 98 or 99, his guarantee was a million dollars. That was, that was a number that, you know, if I wanted to keep Paul, I had to match and I, I chose not to, um, but yeah, that would have been, that would have been about two years later, February of 99, I believe is when that happened. Um, yeah. when he finishes up with you and starts with Vince. So let's just call it what it is. The Hulk Hogan's, the Kevin Nash's, the Goldberg's, all these guys have a downside guarantee that exceeds what the maximum would be, uh, for the WWE. Not only that, I'm sure there were people in the WWF organization who would say, wait a minute, I'm at the same level that guy was on, on nitro, but I'm on raw and we won and he's making this. So therefore I need to make more, uh, that would not have been a problem for you. So in this fantasy booking, this fantasy conversation we're having, ha having here, if you had gotten your hands on WWE, meaning WCW won the war, WWE now has been sold. You'd have a handful of those million dollar guarantees, but you'd probably be able to dig out that value really easy with an undertaker and a triple H and a, and a, and a rock and an Austin. That would have been something that you could have probably pulled the trigger on and everybody else has a much more reasonable dollar figure amount. It is interesting to think what if, because maybe instead of again, no disrespect, the Sean O'Hare's and the Hugh Morris's and the Sean Stasiak's if you could have had that level of talent come over. Cause I think when most fans think about this invasion angle and how it was quote unquote bungled, it's because it didn't have the star power, right. From WCW, but that wouldn't have been a problem going the other direction. Yeah. That would be like acquiring WWE, but the only talent that comes with the package is the guys that signed up two weeks ago at NXT. Right. You know, I mean, it's just, and, and again, no disrespect to that. And that category of people, that shot that you gave us there and in the names that you ran and I was trying to, you know, categorize them in a way. Um, I don't think any one of those people made more than 150 grand a year and some were probably less than that. So that, that wasn't an expensive package to bring in or, and, or justify. It also speaks to, well, I want to ask you, do you, what do you think with the benefit of hindsight? I just want to add some context to what Vince has going on in his life at the time he's purchasing WCW. Uh, he's also going to have the biggest WrestleMania ever that he's ever had WrestleMania 17. Uh, he's also recently just gone public and, 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 and now that's a whole new thing that he's, he's out here pitching and, 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 and juggling a lot of balls in that regard. Oh, by the way, the XFL is a thing now that he's going to venture out and do. Didn't he have a, didn't he have the restaurant? In, uh, in Absolutely. Times Square? That, and he's trying, he's thinking about doing the, the film studio stuff. He's tinkered with the idea of buying a casino. My man is stretched really, 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 really thin to say the least. But I wonder, do you think it's because he didn't have his eye on the ball in that regard? Or did he have so much momentum? Had he convinced himself, I'll be able to make it work. I mean, I've got the Midas touch right now. I'll be able to make this work even without the star power. Or do you think by that point, he believed the brand is where it is. Like we've heard in the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years that Vince is quote unquote, not interested in making another star, the size of stone cold or the rock or Hulk Hogan, because he believes and probably accurately that the brand is, is where the value is. So like when a, when a big time fight is sold, yes, they still call it UFC 204. But there's the two names afterwards that really matter. And when Floyd Mayweather fights, they don't call it something else. They don't say the WBF presents. It's Mayweather versus so and so sort of thing. And it did feel like there for a while, especially in the last several years, it's become more about, well, WWE's coming to town. It's not about Hulk Hogan is wrestling Randy Savage. WWE's coming to town. Do you think he was sold on that? And he thought, I've got the WCW brand. What does it matter who's in there? I mean, why do you think he didn't, it, I'm just trying to find the, the critical flaw in the timing of this, because you and I say a lot on this show that 
timing is everything. And if Vince had a little more patience and didn't rush right into this. Now, wrestling fans certainly know, well, WCW was on TV and now they're not. So the longer it sits, I could see why you would think, well, maybe the, the more value that the brand loses, but if you just push out a half-assed version of it, it's sort of, you know, six. Well, one you're not, you're not, look, there, there was an established WCW audience for several years prior to the acquisition. WCW was the dominant televised wrestling show in the country for a couple of years in the head to head thing, all the boat, you know, our boat floated higher. So did WWE's because of the war. We've all, we've talked about all that, but there were a certain number of people that represented that brand sting, you know, Hulk Hogan, we'll put him in kind of, he was off in the category of his own because he probably still represented WWE more than he really represented WCW because he spent right. more time there. Right. So put, put, put Hulk and even Randy Savage off to the side. You've got your core WCW talent. Ric Flair was much more closely real associated with WCW than he was WWE, even though Rick spent some time in WWE. He's a WCW guy. He's an NWA guy. He's that guy. Um, a lot, you know, Luger, the Steiner brothers, so many. You can just run down, you know, the top 15 people at the top of the roster. All of those people represented the WCW brand, myself included, uh, to a lesser extent. They didn't have any of those people. So you've got the brand, and if there was a critical flaw, it would be assuming that the audience believed just because you had the three letters, you know, WCW, that the audience would follow. And the audience is not going to follow. It, obviously, they didn't follow because they didn't have the talent that represented the brand so that the audience could relate to it, so that it felt like, or it could possibly sh feel, I should say, like a real invasion and a real conflict because those key talents that were driving the viewership for WCW for such a long period of time, if they're not on the roster, they're not on the show. You got a bunch of people who, yeah, I kind of think I've heard of them and maybe I've seen a match or two, but I don't really care. I don't relate to them because they don't relate to WCW in the audience's mind. If that makes sense. You know, and the thing is, I just, I wonder you know, is from a Vince perspective, is it arrogance? Is it lack of patience? Did he not have his eye on the ball? Because it feels like to me to sort of do this invasion angle with the roster he's got, and we know he's going to negotiate, um, buyouts, if you will, with Booker T and DDP. And that goes a long way, but still the invasion gets kicked off with Lance storm jumping in the ring, uh, jumping out of the crowd, jumping in the ring and super kicking, uh, Perry Saturn. I love Lance storm. He was one of my absolute favorite wrestlers in ECW thought he crushed it for you guys in WCW big fan of his. I could watch a Lance storm match every day until I die. However, I can't help, but think about when you did the invasion, here's a guy who was always at the top of the card in razor Ramon, and he's going to come down the aisle and just jump in and cut a promo and take over. And then the next person who makes that switch over with him and joins him is the former main event and the former WrestleMania main event and the former world champion diesel. You've got really two tippy top guys. I don't think it would have had the same effect if we had someone of Lance storm's stature on the card from the WWF. I don't, I know the way that sounds. I don't mean for it to, I love Lance, no, I, but, but Lance is a smart guy. He understands. He knows what you mean. And, and I think our audience does too. And you, and look, you're right, but Scott came over and not only was Scott, as you said, you know, top, top of the roster, obviously a, a big star, but he came over and he created a question. He didn't come over and jump into an angle, right? He came over and made people go, what the hell is going on? And we, we, we tripled down on that when we brought Kevin Nash in and really created the, the question, you know, the intrigue. So it wasn't just an invasion for the sake of an invasion. And we could have done it like everybody else does it, like Vince did it with Lance Storm. We could have just shot an angle. Shot an angle isn't building a story. It's an incident that you build from from that point, but there was no backstory. There was no, there was no mystery. There was no intrigue. There was no what's he doing here. There were so many elements missing from 
from the inv the WWE WCW invasion premise right from the get go. Talent, as we've just discussed, but not only just talent, it's just throwing them out there. It's you know, it's the wrestling version of throwing shit against the wall and seeing if it sticks. Let's just should do it. Let's just you know put it together and let's see how the audience reacts. Sometimes you get you know, sometimes that works. Sometimes it works great, but more often than not, it doesn't. There was no story to it. It wasn't just a talent issue. It was just a let's throw it up against the wall and see if it sticks issue, in my opinion. That's exactly right. And, you know, it would be akin to me, you know, if instead of Scott Hall coming down the steps, it was Shane Douglas or Jeff Jarrett. Yeah, they had been on the other show. Yeah, they had enjoyed success on the other show, but they weren't positioned as a top guy. And, and when this invasion gets kicked off and it's Lance Storm, and to your point, it's not Ric Flair. It's not Sting. It's not Diamond Dallas Page. It's not Booker T. And we know we're going to get there with some of those guys. But imagine if, you know, the first the first time we see anything about this sort of potential invasion, it's Goldberg, Spear in the Rock, or Stone Cold. Man, this whole thing looks a whole lot different. And I just wonder, in hindsight, did we just not have the right patience? Or did Vince not have the right cannonballs this summer? It's not about the size of those cannonballs. It's about making a splash with our friends at manscaped prep for barbecue season by making sure your grill master has the hottest dogs the summer's ever seen. When you're at the cookout, let the meat speak for itself with manscapes perform performance package 4.0. It's time to get ready and not sweaty by going to manscaped.com and using the code 83 weeks. For 20% off and free shipping, the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 has everything you'll need. It's the ultimate bundle for summer grooming. Of course, it's all about that lawnmower 4.0 with the advanced skin safe technology. It's a ceramic blade that's going to make sure you don't get color on your bag meat. I've also <laughs> got a 7,000 RPM motor. It's even got a travel lock, so you don't have to worry about this thing uh, getting some attention at the airport. How about a 4,000 K led light? If you've never seen your scrotum under a 4,000 K led light, I highly recommend it. Uh, did I mention this trimmer is also waterproof? Yeah. You could trim your naughties at the beach. You might get arrested for that. You could do it in the pool, but you might clog the skimmer. I recommend the shower, uh, but I will tell you this, this razor will devour the strongest pubes. Uh, and maybe you've seen Tony Schiavone. He was on beach break AEW last year wearing the Borat swimsuit. And he had the confidence of knowing none of my little coconut hairs are going to be peeking out because I've got the lawnmower. He's also got the crop preserver ball deodorant, which Tony Schiavone has actually gone on record as saying once he started using that Tony Khan called and wrestling was never the same. You see, if you want to get ahead in life, you don't need stinky nuts. You got to have clean smelling balls. JR knows that that's why he's got manscaped. He loves the shed travel bag. That's going to be a free gift for you and the manscaped boxers. I recommend the Shears 2.0. This is a luxury nail grooming kit. This kit includes steel nail cutters, tweezers, and grooming scissors. Shivani has that. He doesn't use it. He's still got the cocaine pinky nail. Check him out next time you see him on TV. Uh, Tony also loves, and this is real, the crop mops. These are individually, individually wrapped wipes that you can just use to freshen up throughout the day. As Tony says, Conrad, they're for your balls and butthole. Uh, so get 20% off and free shipping with the code 83 weeks at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Be sure to use the code 83 weeks manscaped the perfect way to get your patties sizzling hot this summer. And as a reminder, they're for your balls and butthole. I love Tony Shivani, Eric. Isn't that a great line? This is for your balls and butthole Conrad. What? That's, that's rare to see oh, those man, man has no shame no shame in his game at all timing is everything you know we've spent a little time talking about that already um i know he wants to make the most of this uh opportunity this investment if you will and he's probably realizing i got all these guys on the roster if i debut any of them i won't get a second chance to do this i can't necessarily walk it back if you were vince what would you have done differently would you have Doubled down on the investment, tried to go negotiate some of these contracts. I mean, you probably had an idea that some of those guys were not ever going to do that. And to put that in proper context, Hey, Mr. Nash, would you like to continue getting $2 million to just check the mail? Or would you like to cut it in half and work your ass off? I mean, who, who goes for that? So that's really a tough sell. If you were in that spot, 
what would you have done? I could have been in that spot and I turned it down. <laughs> I mean, I, I got a call ahead of the invasion and, uh, from JR and had an opportunity and I, I, I passed because and it was a timing issue. It wasn't, you know, angry or resentful or any of that. It was just timing. Um, what would I have done? I would have waited. I wouldn't have rushed it knowing that I didn't have any of the, the key talents that represented the brand. And I would have tried to negotiate. Even if you wouldn't have gotten a Nash who was who would have elected to stay home because that was a smart thing to do. He's not risking any injury. He's at home with his family. Doesn't have to go through the grind of traveling. Doesn't have to go through the grind because people think, oh, man, you'd be a part of WWE. Oh, it'd be awesome. It's a freaking grind. And when you're 6'11 and 300 some odd pounds, it's even more of a grind. Just moving from place to place. So... I think the Kevin Nash is the Scott Halls. Um, Sting Sting could have been a Sting could have they they could have worked something out with Sting if they worked hard enough at it and and gave it some time because a guy like Sting and I'm not certainly not speaking for him. I don't want to misrepresent that Sting and I have talked about this. This is just me speaking as someone who knew Sting pretty well and was pretty close to him for a long time. And I understood how Sting processed things. Sting would have been very reluctant, in my opinion, to, to, to cross the river, so to speak. Not because of the money, because Sting really wasn't making that much. Sting was making a lot of money at the time, but not as much as some of the other names that you mentioned. Right. Um, Sting would have been affordable at that time, particularly given the, the size of the guarantees that Vince was giving out at that time. Vince would have had to convince S Steve Borden that he wasn't going to be made an example of because much like Turner executives had a perception of WCW and you know, all that that we've already discussed, the perception within WCW is that, oh yeah, if you go to WWE, he's going to prove that, you know, WWE is superior and their talent is superior. You're just going to get buried and they're going to embarrass you. And once they're done having fun with you, then if you still stick around, maybe they're going to do something with you. But the perception was, as there was going to be this like uh, initiation process uh and and it would be ugly and miserable and you wouldn't enjoy it vince could have overcome that with steve it would have taken time and i think once you landed a steve borden um as the sting character and, and one or two others like sting even if they were kind of lower on the roster less exposed maybe less main events under the belt whatever not to be disrespectful but all you needed was one anchor like a sting if sting would have come lex luger would have come right if it, now that lex luger's there and stings there i guess we'd follow shortly thereafter the steiner brothers now you've got enough and if i would have made a different decision perhaps i would have been leading that charge then you've got an invasion that at least the audience feels like it could be true right. or could relate to the angst and the conflict that would exist between the, 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 that WCW roster and those names that I just represented, there would be, you could have created a conflict that would have felt real and believable, much like the NWO story felt real and believable in the very beginning. You could have done that, but it would have required a little more time, a little more salesmanship, and a little more money, but not a lot more. It's uh, it's interesting to think, you know, what could have been if you had your druthers, you know, is there a, a dream way to kick this off? Like, let's say you're in charge. We're, we're seeing that. And, and listen, let's add this context in here too. Yes. The WWF was hotter than ever. We'll call it March, 2001, but at the very beginning of April, when Steve Austin turned heel and joined Vince McMahon at the end of WrestleMania, business started falling. Tickets were down. Ratings were down. It wasn't the same. And I know that Austin was feeling like, Hey man, I've kind of done it. All, everything I need to do of, I, I don't want to get stale here. I don't want to lose this momentum. I need to keep it fresh. Maybe I can 
switch sides and have a whole new crop of opponents. That makes sense. But he perhaps was asking for that without the vision of what was possible with this invasion. And at the time, nobody really knew what that was going to even look like or what it was. I mean, they literally uh, made that acquisition within a week prior to WrestleMania. So if his brain was already, I'm going to turn heel, this is what I'm doing. It's hard to go to your top star and say, well, we're not doing that now. Um, and especially that top star, <laughs> that top star, and with all the other stuff Vince has going on, he probably thinks, yeah, why not? Let's make our top star happy. Let's keep him happy. But now it's like, okay, we start to see the business slip. It slips in May. It slips in June. And Vince doesn't want to lose this momentum. And he thinks, okay, I'm looking for new ideas. I need a shot in the arm. I need something fresh. We're going to do the invasion angle. So they start it. Now, if, if you, I realize circumstances would have to be a lot different, but if you were in the op, if you had the opportunity to, to do that and you maybe can't go out and cut deals with everybody who's on the sideline getting paid from Turner, is there one guy you would have said, okay, this is the guy to kick it off with. I'm not going to invest in all of them. I don't want to upset the apple cart with my current roster, but I got to have one star to kick this thing off. Right. Who would it be? And why sting? Because I think other than Ric Flair, and, and really the reason Sting was, aside from Hogan, for the for the largest portion of the existence of WCW, Ric Flair and Sting represented that brand. And I think at that particularly at that point in time, it would have been Sting. And can you imagine too if it was Sting and he brought that spooky kooky crow character along with him? Yeah. And kind of not replicate, but extend the kind of uh, imagery and, and the mystique that the Crow character brought so that he started showing up at WWE events and stalking certain people or whatever. I mean, I, th that would be the guy for me. If I, if I was in Vince's shoes at that time and I could only pick one guy, if I understood your question correctly, it absolutely would have been Sting. So how would you, how would you, creatively now we're going to fantasy book here sting's going to appear on raw we got that what's he going to do how do we how do we kick him off how do we introduce him to this wwf audience that's never seen him before who is he attacking or watching from the rafters or how would you make that debut so what what time of year was this when when sting would have appeared when was the invasion launched in wwe Let, let's let's call it summer of 2001 so whether you want to say June or July, we'll go with it. So I would have thought I would have looked at a calendar and said, okay, what's my main event three months from now? I would right. have taken three months to build the backstory and, and act one would, would have taken a month. And let's say in act one, let's just go with the, the example I gave of using, utilizing the Sting's kooky crow character, spooky kooky crow character. Um, after the acquisition, after the announcement, I would have gone radio silent with regards to anything that had to do with WCW. Would not have talked about it, wouldn't told all the talent not to talk about it. Just let the dust settle on the acquisition. When the time was right, Sting's my only guy. I would have full rights to that Crow character. I would say, okay, who do I want him in the main event with it? Whatever pay-per-view would have been 30 days from the date that it started. And if you're going to go, why not go for the biggest? Let's just use let's use Undertaker as he's it. Would that work, though? Would those two characters work against each other? Let me give you this heads up, this context. King of the ring is at the end of June, 2001, Steve Austin finds himself in the main event. Uh, of course he is the, he's the champ and he's going to be working with Chris Benoit and Chris Jericho. And out of nowhere, Booker T interferes and tosses Steve Austin through the announced table, nearly costing him the title. Now he doesn't cost him the title, but he at least interfered. And it's the first time we would see Booker T and this is on pay-per-view. So the next day on raw Shane McMahon marches out and says, Hey, everybody knows I bought WCW and our intention is to invade the WWF. 
and and now we're off to the races. See, right there, it's not believable. Right there, yeah. you just took you abs. First of all, it was throwing shit up against the wall with Booker. No backstory, no intrigue, no anticipation, no build up. Just boom, let's do this and surprise everybody. And don't get me wrong, sometimes that works really well. But in in a in a situation like this, you need to build some. What is, what's going to happen? We got to tune in next. What's what's going on? You got to create some chatter and mystique about it. Um, keep going. I'm sorry. Keep going. No, I'm just curious. You know, if you're going to debut Sting, would you have done it at King of the Ring on pay per view? I I probably would not. I would want to have that happen in front of the biggest audience I could. I would want it to happen on Raw. And would you would you have Sting attack your top guy and Steve Austin? Because at that point. Steve Austin's a bad guy. I, Cause to me, like when you said it would Let's be right there, let me, I got to stop you. Cause, cause my brain can only function at a certain pace. Sure. 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 Steve Austin and sting doesn't work for me because Steve Austin's a heel and sting is the baby face from the former WCW that they were at war with. So there's, there, there's a creative disconnect there for me. You would have to address that somehow. Well, you picked it. So I was going with what you picked. I wouldn't have picked Sting. If I'm going to attack Steve Austin, I would want somebody I could have a backstory with Steve Austin with somehow. But see, that's where, you know, I would pick Sting as the guy for WCW to build the invasion story around. I would, Sting would be my general. He would, be, he would be leading the charge and I would build everything behind Sting. Right. So the, yeah. the matchup, I don't know that it would be with Austin. The matchup would, would have, there would have to be a story that isn't, because there's no there's no story between Sting and Austin. There's no reason. What would the motivation be for Sting to show up and all of a sudden defend the good name of WWF? It doesn't make sense to me. So so what would you do? I again I think I I would I would sit back I would surround myself with some people that were better at this than I am. But first of all, sit around and think about what's the best story moving forward, what's the best main event 3 months from now. And, and Sting would have to have a motivation, right, to come out of the to, to come out of nowhere and start stalking and taunting and teasing that he's interested in what's going on. Perhaps, perhaps it could have been a WCW sacrificial lamb, and Booker T wouldn't have been the right one because Booker T's too big of a star. But if someone from WCW, WCW, who had been of, of less stature, stature is not the right word. You know what I mean. Uh, lower down the roster than Sting. Somebody were to fight. Okay, here we go. Here we go. <clears throat> go silent. No discussion of WCW. Eventually start talking about, well, you know, we've acquired WCW and we finally got, you know, the WCW roster going. No, that wouldn't work because it's an evasion angle. N never mind. No talk about WCW. All of a sudden we see somebody come in, not Booker T., Try to get involved in a WWE match, a baby face, not a heel, right? A baby face come in from WCW, finally getting an opportunity in WWF and gets not as a WCW representative, a former WCW star, quote unquote, some money that everybody would recognize finally gets an opportunity. The first one and JR, whoever was doing color and play by play at the time, could have said, Oh, yeah, you remember a couple of months ago, we acquired WCW, former WCW star, blah, 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 enters the ring and just gets trashed, gets hammered, double team, triple team, gets beat to a pulp, almost like a gang initiation. If you can, if you can survive this, then you're on the team kind of thing. Same thing happens a week later or two weeks later. And all of a sudden, it's obvious to the audience that, indeed, WWF, the heels, are absolutely destroying some of this young talent that's just trying to get a gig in WWF. Now there's a reason for saying to go, well, this is fucked up. I'm not going to let this happen. And now you've got Sting showing up. And then bring in Shane McMahon. And say, I agree with Sting. This is not the right way to do this, or whatever the verbiage would be. But there would have whatever the motivation is, there would have to be motivation for Sting to show up and and right a wrong in typical babyface fashion, even though he's a spooky crow character. And somehow or another, he would have to be there to right a wrong. 
that would be an interesting way or a version of that because we're just riffing here. That would be an interesting way, I think, to bring not just Sting in the Crow character gimmick, but to take the Sting Crow character that worked so well because of a similar situation that we just described that was happening in WCW back in 96 or 97. Now that same character with the same motivation and the same righteous perspective of life, and he's here to, to fix the thing that's wrong, that would have been consistent with Sting's character. So you not only had the look of the Crow character, now you've got the consistency of what the audience believed in with, with Steve Borden. I would have launched it. I mean, that's a bad idea, but it's off the top of my head. Not a bad idea, but it's a, yeah, it's a loose idea at best. But something like that, there would have to be a motivation other than just, boom, here I am. It's interesting to think, you know, uh, this is the most celebrated opportunity and perhaps bungled opportunity in WWE history. But our old pal Jeff Jarrett on Tuesdays always reminds us creative is subjective. And I think this is a, an excellent way to, to sort of explore that. Um, creative is subjective all the way up until the point you put it on television. Then you find out whether it's subjective or not. Well, I mean, even then I think there's some stuff that I would like and you wouldn't like and vice versa. That's fair. Some That's will fair. like it. Some won't. So what is, is I think the attitude and and, and I get that they, they're trying to do stuff, but this does feel like the biggest, perhaps what if, um, the WWF runs out of patience and they have Shane McMahon become the face of WCW. And this is happening at the same time. The dude is wrestling Kurt angle, which is a little silly in hindsight. It feels less than to not have you be a part of it. And you alluded to the call that you got with Jr. and you said the timing was, wasn't maybe right here. But I also got the vibe in talking to you before Jr. wasn't really trying to sell you on this idea. And I don't know if that was just, uh, he wasn't really pleased with y'all's previous interaction in WCW or what have you, but with the right sell job, do you think you would have considered leading the charge for this thing? Absolutely would have had I been given a little bit more notice because I honestly, I wasn't TV ready. I had to let myself go a lot. You know, I'm uh, right now I'm about 185 pounds when, and I'm, I'm probably way less now than I did in 1995 or 1990 for that matter. I don't think I've been 185 pounds in 30 years, but at that time I was up to 225, which doesn't sound like a lot because you know, I'm 5'10", 225. It's not too bad, but I'm not a, I'm a natural 175 pounder. That's probably what I should weigh. And I had ballooned up to about 220, 225. I looked horrible on television. So, and I, even when I finally showed up in WWE a year later, I still looked pretty horrible for television, not for walk around, but I was not TV ready. Um, had I get, been given a month's notice to, to at least try to correct that a little bit. Uh, and also it, it was happening over a period of time when I had a lot of friends and family in town and I just couldn't on short notice, like 48 hours, which is all the notice I really got. I, I couldn't, I just couldn't it was bad timing. And, but I probably, you know, who knows, had it been explained to me and, and I, I would have given a little bit more time. Absolutely. I would have done it because it would have been fun. It would have been fun. And it's fun to think about what could have been, you know, I know that it would have made sense to even bring you back in O2 two when they did the whole NWO thing. Uh, I guess well, that would have made more sense, right? If you would have started this thing early with sting and stings leading it and build a story out add a couple more former WCW talents to Sting's brigade. And they're, they're not gaining any ground, but they're putting up a hell of a good fight. Stack up a few more talents that actually matter a little bit. Bring me in. Let me start bringing that talent in. Now you have something that feels like an invasion with a motivation. Yes. And and just to add that context, we're saying we're not going to do this deal with Kevin Nash and Scott Hall and Hulk Hogan. They want too much money and will upset, you know, our our current pay structure. That's the that's the talk in March of two thousand one. We do the actual invasion in July of 2001. We sunset it in November of 2001. And then in February of 2002, here comes Scott Hall, Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan. Like what? 
like in the scheme of things, it's three months after it's dead. What's the difference, right? And 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 again, because we have the luxury of 2020 hindsight and being fucking creative geniuses after the fact. <laughs> uh, but if you think about that from a what if you know point of view, had and I mean, I love Shane McMahon. We're good friends, and, and he's an amazing talent. I have nothing but respect for for uh, Shane, and I can't wait to to see him again down the road. But it, that was a bad fit. It, it was not believable. It was just, eh, okay, I get it. He's playing a role, and he's doing what we're supposed to do here to tell a wrestling story, but it didn't, it didn't work. Had, that, had I been able to take that role, had we been able to build up an invasion story that seemed to have motivation, it wasn't just thrown out there like an afterthought, and see if it sticks or not, but have a, have, have a story similar to the one that we just laid out briefly. Um, let that... Let Sting and his team get so close to achieving whatever the stakes were. Um, we'd have to create those stakes. But have them get so close to getting that brass ring, whatever it would have been, only to somehow not get it. Now with me in that position, what would I do? If Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan all of a sudden are available a year later, again, that that would have felt so believable. It would have gotten a completely different reaction and there would have been continuity to the story. It wouldn't have just started, stop, start again. The other thing I think that is uh, a glaring hole in this whole invasion piece of business is we have our first WCW match Booker T and buff Bagwell in Tacoma. Now, on the one hand, it's like, yeah, well, what's the big deal? Well, I don't know the next freaking week they're at the Georgia dome in Atlanta. Like to me, if you're going to start this invasion angle and I get that we're all, as you said, creative geniuses with the benefit of hindsight, like you, you start this thing at the Georgia dome in Atlanta. That's where it kicks off. Right. That like, would have made no, sense. But again, there's no, why there was no, it was just. Oh, it's Marcus Bagwell and Booker T. They're WCW guys. We're in Tacoma. Let's just throw it up against the wall. Or even we're in Georgia, which would have made a lot more sense. Yeah. But it wouldn't have made as much sense as it would have in Georgia or anywhere else, particularly in Atlanta, if there would have been an explanation and a story. Otherwise, it's just, yep, there's Marcus Bagwell. He's from WCW, Booker T, WCW. And you're selling it in your commentary, but it still just pops up out of the ground without any backstory, without any reason, without any stakes, without any motivation. It's just two guys wrestling. What if, and I know that this is silly, right? Everything in wrestling is a little silly. We got to suspend our disbelief, but if they're in the Georgia dome and stone cold, Steve Austin is out there and he just starts cutting promos about how, you know, he's got no competition. You know, he's dominated everybody in WWE. He's beat the rock. He's beat so-and-so he's beat so-and-so by the way, there was this little piss ant company here in Atlanta, Georgia. They said, uh, you know, I wasn't worth nothing, blah, blah, blah. You know, typical Steve Austin speech. Boo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He could start trashing on the lead up to that show. And then actually in the ring during that show. And what if we did the whole, here's the NWO. And maybe, maybe he's, of course, he's aligned himself. He being Steve Austin with Vince McMahon, you bought WCW, but you didn't buy the NWO sort of thing. Ooh, you know, that could have been a thing. And all of a sudden, if now Steve Austin and Vince McMahon are standing in the ring and here's Hulk Hogan and Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and Eric Bischoff. Yeah. You bought WCW, but you didn't buy the NWO, man. That could have been, that would have got. The idea that you and Vince come face to face in the Georgia dome in Atlanta, he's got his band of merry misfits, including stone cold standing behind him. And you've got the NWO behind you. That could have been something too. Like, it just feels like there's a lot of opportunity here with the benefit of hindsight. And I know at the time we're saying, oh, we can't afford it. But then magically they just shit the cash a handful of months later. It, 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 it was right there and we just didn't do it. I mean, it's what you just laid out with, with the NWO and Austin and McMahon in the ring and the NWO on the other side of the ring. Oh my God. 
that would have been so badass. That that would have been so badass. And could you imagine the match you could have had with Steve Austin and Scott Hall? That would have been freaking awesome. With especially with that setup, that would have been what a that would have been phenomenal, and it would have made a lot of money. And it was right there. I mean, they're doing it in the Georgia dome and I mean, it would have even been cool if, you know, we're mixing it up and, and, and Goldberg to me, when I think of the Georgia dome, I think of Goldberg, do you know it? Like he's the guy I think is most synonymous with that building and wrestling. To me. And, and honestly, now with the NWO that would have eclipsed Goldberg's impact. I mean, the NWO was bigger than Bill. The NWO was so big that it would have been bigger than Goldberg by himself. In, sure. in in Atlanta, but if you didn't have the NWO and you needed that other person, yeah, Goldberg would be your guy. Goldberg walks on water in Georgia, and he did at that time. Probably still does. You know, he, he yeah, he was on the Atlanta Falcons football team, and everybody gave him a lot of props for that. But he was most known most known for his college career in Georgia. So yeah, you would have that would have been awesome. I mean, I think it could have been interesting to, uh, to just see Goldberg again. I know that we're, we're saying at the time, Austin's a heel. Well, technically the NWO would be heels, but if they're all going to kind of come face to face, maybe if the NWO was trying to take over and they, they're given a beat down, if Goldberg makes the save in the Georgia dome and he finds himself so, shoulder to shoulder with Austin. And of course we know that's not going to last. Eventually that one's going to turn on the other. Somebody's getting a stunner. We could build on that story. But it just feels like in the Georgia Dome, it's the perfect opportunity to do this sort of thing. You know what, though? Here's probably why that didn't happen. Maybe the risk in that story would be NWO would have gotten over. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, they, they would have gotten. Wouldn't that be terrible if people liked it and tuned in? But that's now you're running against a cultural grain. Right. So dumb. Now, now you've got, now you've got a, now you've got an emotional problem within the hierarchy of WWE. And that's likely why that didn't happen. Don't you think that's a little silly? Of course it's absolutely insane, but it's part of human nature. You know, We're, none of us are perfect and it's, it's a flaw, but it's, that one was a big one. You know, it, it, there was some ego involved in there. If that was discussed and it didn't happen, that was an ego decision, not a financial decision. I don't know that, you know, the eye, I don't think, I don't think Vince's eye was all the way on the ball. Like it would have been. I, I, and honestly, you're giving him, you know, some slack and perhaps you're right about that. Um, nothing but massive respect for Vince McMahon. And, and, and I like him personally, but historically Vince doesn't, didn't hasn't liked to acknowledge, acknowledge anything other than WWE. Yeah. WWE is the standard. Everything else that's not WWE that didn't come up through the WWE cultural process and learn how to perform to the expectations and the unique perspective sometimes of Vince McMahon. If you're not on his list, you, you're a second class citizen. It's just a fact. And Maybe that's one of the reasons why the WWE is such a powerful brand today and worth nine billion dollars stock price trading at a hundred and twelve bucks. I mean, I was sitting in one of your offices a couple of years ago and kind of bottom fell out and there was all this kinds of transition. And I made up my mind, despite the fact that at that time I didn't have a lot of disposable income to invest. If that thing hits 35 bucks, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to sell some shit because I gotta buy that. It was that close to thirty five dollars. A share now it's up to 112 and i think yeah. the reason for that is because vince's focus and commitment as you started this podcast out earlier it's all about the brand and not about the talent but there is some ego involved in some kind of cultural patterns that we've all seen over the years and heard about from people who are on the receiving end of it it's just it was it was a perfect storm and a perfect opportunity but it was never going to happen there was never a scenario. I can't imagine a scenario where Vince would have allowed the NWO and Bill Goldberg 
to get a massive reaction and fans side with that side of the equation over any WWE combination. Vince, I, don't, I just can't believe he would have given you a million other reasons why, but at right. the core of it, uh, I'm not letting those guys come in here and steal the, 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 the loyalty from my audience and my roster. Gonna happen. You know, as you may recall, one of the original ideas was, or at least this is the rumor. Hey, maybe we'll, we'll call Monday night raw. We'll make that a WCW show and, 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 and maybe it'll be WCW raw and maybe there'll be a new show on TNN because yeah, you know, th that's, that's the new opportunity that's presented itself. And well, that Tacoma thing goes so badly that that's all scrapped and they have to come up with these creative ideas. And one of the ideas is, Hey, DDP still wants to play. Maybe he thinks there's an opportunity to bet on himself. He's the most positive guy. We know he's going to go put in the work. He's going to take a pay cut and see, make a go at it. And instead of this being, uh, some dynamite storyline, man, it just feels like it's bad from the beginning. He's going to start stalking the undertaker's wife. Now wrestling fans at home. know he's married to Kimberly. Why are you stalking anybody? What? Uh, that creative is just less than ideal. And I know DDP saw himself as the people's champ of WCW. He would have liked to have wrestled the people's champ of the WWF, the rock. Uh, if you had your druthers, what would have been a cool way to introduce DDP into this audience? Because I understand that when I ask you that question, a lot of people who are Eric Bischoff or DDP haters are going to say, oh, you're just asking him because he's his friend. No, I'm asking him because the diamond cutter was still arguably the number one or number two hottest move in the whole industry. So if he slides in, in any match and hits a diamond cutter, huge impact right away, throws up the hand sign. You could see a, a good shot of that on the hard cam. You talk about making impact again, not disrespecting Lance storm at all. The diamond cutter way more over than a super kick at that point. Like to me, if you're going, he could have been another guy that really kicked this thing off interfering in some match with a diamond cutter. Everybody knows who that is. As soon as it hits, what would have been a good idea for DDP? Do you think? Well, easily going back to the original concept of, you know, creating a situation where a, d a former WCW star finally gets their opportunity and then just gets abused in the process simply because he or she was from WCW. Now there's a motivation Would that DDP. Could he have been the guy he, and by the way, you know, I don't know why I don't think of DDP right away. I don't think I would have led with DDP, but he'd be my number two. He'd be my number. He'd be my Kevin Nash. In the context of Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, ultimately Hulk Hogan, and he he could have been such a great baby face. I mean, again, you've got a WCW star, and in a course, if you're from if you're in the WWE culture, you look down your nose at that, especially at that time. Just it is what it is, or was what it was. Um, but DDP had he was he, he he was like the phoenix rising from the ashes he went from kind of a middle of the bottom of the roster to a, a legitimate big star in a relatively short very short period of time really in the big scheme of things he would have been that great baby face he could have done a couple promos i finally get an opportunity i'm really you know i'm glad wwe brought out wcw i love wcw my opportunity there but at least you know we get a chance to continue pursuing this passion we love blah 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 blah, blah and have him go out there and just get beat half to death he would have been that good sympathetic baby face but to bring him in as a heel after he'd been established and there was so much equity in the minds of the audience as a huge you know Man of the people, one of yeah. them coming down through the crowd. I finally did it. Adrian, I finally did. Everybody said I couldn't. I finally did. All that good shit, right? Yeah. And just pretend none of it ever happened and bring him in as a heel. What the fuck? That's kind of arrogant, don't you think? That's assuming your audience never paid attention to everything this man did previously. That's just arrogant. Doesn't make any sense. I think bringing DDP in as a baby face that is a catalyst for an appearance by sting would have been an awesome situation. And I contradicted myself because I said, I would have used him as my number two. I would have used him. I would have used DDP as that person that provided the motivation for Steve Borden 
I would not have had him following Undertaker's wife for all. What the fuck? No, that's a terrible idea. That's the worst idea is one of the worst ideas I've ever heard. We do see Buff Bagwell have a match here that's been pretty controversial. This is that match in Tacoma. Um, I do want to talk about Buff, but before I do, I want to mention that the fans of Tacoma, they're not with it. They're chanting boring. They're chanting this match sucks. They're even chanting Goldberg. And to me, that's just another indicator that we needed to find a spot for Goldberg. We needed to spot, find a spot. And I realize we're trying Austin as a heel, but Austin Goldberg could have crushed. I mean, this is one of those dream matches. Um, Kevin Sullivan was with us for top guy weekend and here in Huntsville, uh, as a part of what we do with adfreeshows.com. And he dropped a few nuggets on us. And one of the biggest pieces that I heard from him that was like, wow, I never really thought about that. Because I, like a lot of wrestling fans, thought, okay, they just wanted to make him look like Steve Austin, but they put some UFC gloves on him. That's what they were looking for because Austin was getting hot in September of 97. He's about to become a made man. And well, that makes sense because that's when Goldberg debuted on TV, September of 97. Now, when we talk to Kevin Sullivan, he says, yeah, I went down to the power plant, saw what he was doing and said, hey, we got something with this guy. He's intense. He's explosive. Let's make him our version, the wrestling version of Mike Tyson. He was doing all the head stuff. Like, let's just do more of that. Let's put some gloves on him, but he's got to be able to hold the guy. So we'll cut the fingertips off, but let's put him in black trunks and little short black boots and do like an entrance from the back. Like Tyson used to do. Once he gets over, we'll just make him like the wrestling version of Mike Tyson. And at the time in 1997, Tyson's the biggest box office star, not Steve Austin. Tyson is the pay-per-view superstar. And why would the number one company take a look at the number two company and say, Hey, we want, we, let's, let's copy that. That doesn't make any sense. It makes a lot of sense to make him the wrestling version of Mike Tyson. And I don't know until Kevin Sullivan laid that out at top guy weekend that I've ever put that together. What do you think of that? I think that makes a tremendous amount of sense. Yeah, and, and Kevin was right there in the middle of it, probably long before I was. It would have been Kevin that brought my attention to this amazing potential we had in the power plant. I didn't spend a lot of time evaluating talent. That wasn't my strength. That wasn't, you know, I, I didn't have any confidence in my ability to look at talent and go, oh, I see something in that person. You know, afterwards, and I see him perform, and I get a sense of what you know what they're like in a mic and things like that. I paid a lot of attention to that, but I didn't pay a lot of attention to the talent of the power plant where Kevin Sullivan did. Kevin Sullivan saw something initially that clearly, you know, I didn't see. He saw it way before me. It makes sense. It and is, it was, uh, and and even Austin, you know, I mean, there are obviously you know, you can't deny the similarities. I mean, just physical similarities, but even in their gear and their appearance. Um, a lot of similarities, but, but I think, you know, Goldberg did have that MMA legitimate fighter vibe that set him, even though they looked very similar and, you know, had the same ring gear, essentially Goldberg had a different vibe to him than Austin did. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. And he was something fresh and that's what we're all looking for, which is why we're excited to talk to you about hello fresh, where you can get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. This lets you skip all the trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit, and it's easy to see why. They've got a brand new fresh and fit summer menu. It's going to bring that flavor right to your door. I got to admit, when I first heard about HelloFresh, I was a little intimidated. I'm pretty handy with a grill, but I thought to myself, self, can I really handle some of these complicated items that they're going to send me? Because I had heard that they had really fun stuff, but I didn't think it was something I could make like a, a backyard bratwurst. Okay. I could probably handle that. What about a, a key lime pie? I, I don't think I can do that. Well, you can with hello fresh. They make it so simple. First of all, they've got, and I'm talking about pictures. You, <laughs> this is not just instructions. Make, take this and put it in there. Okay. I got that. It's so simple. Even I could do it. It was a breeze. It's not a chore. And by the way, it's fun. I've done it with my wife. She couldn't believe I was in there helping, but I was intimidated because whenever she would say, Hey, go do so-and-so man, I don't really know exactly how to do that. 
Okay, now with the pictures, I got it. Oh, I can do this. And here's the other cool part. We've all been in this circumstance before. When you were planning on cooking something at the house, or maybe you don't cook, but your wife does, she'll call and say, hey, can you stop by the store? I forgot so-and-so. And then you get in there and you're like, well, there's four different types of that. I'm not sure which one to get. I don't want to get fussed at. I'm going to get all four. Don't overbuy. That's not what this is about. They're going to send you exactly what you need in the exact amount you need and the step-by-step -step instructions. It makes it a breeze. And when they say fresh, they mean it. It's from the farm to your door in less than a week. And we're not just talking about dinners. Now, HelloFresh can hook you up with your snacks, your sides, and everything else. Like they've got over a hundred different options. And when I say different options, I mean for every type of lifestyle. Maybe you're looking for calorie smart and trying to drop some LBs. They got you. Maybe you're like Jeff Jarrett trying to add some protein and bulk up. Well, they got that covered too. If you're vegan, don't stress. They got you hooked up there as well. This is fast. It's fresh. It's tasty. It checks all the boxes and it'll help you get out of that rut. Man, they've got over 40 different recipes a week to choose from every single week. So you're not going to get in that rut of, man, I'm eating the same thing over and over and over. And if you're like me and you're short on time because you're probably doing too much, they've even got fast and fresh as an option, which means you can get started and start eating in 15 minutes or less. How do you beat that? Not only is it better for you, not only is it more fun and higher quality, it's also 25% cheaper than takeout. It's no wonder that HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. And right now we want you to try it. Go to hellofresh.com slash 83 weeks, 50 and use our code 83 weeks, 50 for 50% 50 off plus free shipping. That's 83 weeks, 50 and use the code 83 weeks, 50 for 50% 50 off. I want to give it to you again. Hellofresh.com slash 83 weeks, 50. Be sure to use that promo code 83 weeks, 50. You'll get 50% 50 off. How do you beat that? Well, you get free shipping too. You can do it both. Do both with uh, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. All right, Eric, we talked about HelloFresh. Let's talk about something that they were trying to do that was a little fresh. What's better than a WWF versus WCW angle? Hmm. What if we made it a three-way dance, as they used to call it in ECW? Paul Heyman is going to become a part of the alliance, but of course we have to have a McMahon all over this thing. So Stephanie McMahon has now bought ECW. So Shane McMahon has WCW. Vince McMahon has the WWF. And now Stephanie has ECW. To me, this is when the whole thing sort of jumps the shark. Uh, no disrespect to Stephanie. I think she was one of the best television characters of the era. We're seeing her very early, but man, she became a mega heel like 10 years ago when she was a part of the authority. And she's slapping folks. Now I understand you needed to pay that off of the match at some point, but as far as a television performer, I thought she was fantastic. However, when I think of ECW, the last person I associated with it is Stephanie. And as an ECW fan, a diehard, I found myself going, oh man, what'd you think? Is this what it jumped the shark for you? Like a trained one at SeaWorld. Yeah. You know, I mean, ugh. and I agree with you. I, Stephanie was a great performer. I loved working with Stephanie because she, she was so believable. She got into her character. She wasn't just saying the words and remember, you know, memorizing a script, you know, her body language, her eyes, her facial expressions. She was such a great performer. And, and again, she, she has so much credibility. Uh, but to miscast her, I mean, I like if you had a contest to see who could cast something the worst, that would have probably won some kind of award. That was horrible. To me, the way to do this, and again, what do I know? But the way to do this is, and you guys tried it in 05. We had all three of you in the ring. Vince owns the WWF, you quote unquote run WCW and Paul Heyman quote unquote runs ECW and just leave the McMahon kids completely out of it. Let them do what, why would they, I mean, I understand from a storyline perspective and you and I have gone on and on about how much we loved succession. And I think they just got 27 Emmy nominations. It was all about the family and their dysfunction and who's taking over. That is a story. 
that, that has interest, but I don't think we need to complicate the invasion storyline for that. Like these dream matches that we used to see on these after mags on the cover, there was never any, what if Stephanie tried to supplant her dad? That's not a thing. Like we don't care. Um, and we could have, but let's not confuse the issue with, with WCW and ECW. Jeff Jarrett often says on his podcast, if you confuse them, you lose them. This is getting a little convoluted for me now, right? More than convoluted. It's just, it's just not believable in any, this is nothing anybody can grab a hold of here. It's just bad. Really from the get go, the idea was bad. Had you had Heyman and Bischoff and, and, uh, who's the other one you, you talked about you and, uh, Paul Heyman and, and Vince McMahon, like those are the three heads, right? So like, yeah, yeah. Let, leave it at that. Leave yeah. it at that. And you know, you could have put Stephanie in there. Instead of Vince, Vince may not have wanted to put himself in that position because that requires, you know, week in on week out. And sometimes you have the time to do it. Sometimes you don't. But even if Vince wasn't willing to kind of take the, the that third position or first position and Heyman and I would have shared second and third, um, put Stephanie in that. That would have been believable. Having Stephanie or even Shane, Stephanie, Stephanie would have made a little bit more sense, I think, um, because you couldn't touch her, right? She she had an advantage in that respect. Um, that would have worked, could have worked, but yeah, this. And here's the thing: at wrestling fans, as crappy as it was, they're so in love with this concept that the pay per view, the first one, Invasion, man, it crushes. It's the highest uh, grossing, most purchased WWF pay per view in history outside of a WrestleMania. So besides a WrestleMania, this is the high watermark. And if you're watching on YouTube, you see the poster and I know what you're thinking, man, the invasion. So you probably got all the WCW guys on one side and all the WWF guys on the other side, and probably the ECW guys across the bottom. Nope. We got half Shane's face, half Vince's face. And at the very bottom, the three logos, and they went with the most recent terrible WCW logo. I would have used the OG logos for both ECW and the WWE and ECW. Just use the old school logos. But that poster, man, it doesn't show the talent. It doesn't tell the story. But the card itself does tell the story of the invasion. We get Edge and Christian taking on Lance Storm and Mike Awesome. We get Earl Hebner taking on Nick Patrick. That's kind of fun. Mick Foley's the special guest referee. We get the APA taking on Chuck Palumbo and Sean O'Hare. We get Billy Kidman taking on X-Pac Raven wrestling William Regal, which is interesting because Regal's the WWF guy. And now Raven is an Alliance guy, Chris Canyon, Hugh Morris, and Sean Stasiak taking on Albert big show and Billy Gunn Tajiri taking on Taz Rob Van Dam taking on Jeff Hardy. Probably the match of the night. Definitely the match of the night. Trish Stratus teaming with Lita to take on Tori Wilson and Stacey Keebler in a bra and panties match. Roll Tide. And then in the main event, the Alliance, Booker T, Bubba Ray Dudley, Diamond Dallas Page, Devon Dudley, and Rhino take on the Alliance. Or that is the Alliance. They take on Team WWF. Chris Jericho, Kane, Kurt Angle, Stone Cold, and The Undertaker. And this, even though it's not perhaps as star studded on the WCW side as you would want, I mean, DDP and Booker T check the box, the Dudleys certainly check the ECW box. It does 775,000 buys, but I just can't help, but look at that card, especially the undercard and think, man, what could have been like the Dudleys should have been in one of these tag matches, like the Dudleys versus APA or the Dudleys versus edge and Christian, something like that makes sense as opposed to maybe what we got. Um, but man, it just tells you just based on the storyline alone, Eric, it's a high watermark for the company, 775,000 people buy it, hoping, wishing what's going to happen. I don't know. And then the wheels come off. Yeah. That's one of the, one of the disadvantages. Sometimes when you, you build something up and you create a perception and you, 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 you have all this expectation, especially when you've had a history of surprising people and, you know, you've conditioned your audience over years 
to expect the unexpected. This, this had so much potential. That's great news. And you get everybody that comes into your restaurant called the pay-per-view. And how many people bought this pay-per-view? 775,000. Wow. That's kind of massive. So you get 775,000 people that show up to your restaurant and they all leave disappointed. That's, that's tough to fix, which is probably why they abandoned a lot of this afterwards. If they did, I'm not sure what they did, but ugh, yeah, the, the, the good news is 775,000 people showed up. The bad news, they probably left a little less than impressed. You know, what's crazy to me, Eric, just, you know, we, we love on this program to say context is King, you know, right off the top of your head, what was the most successful WCW pay-per-view in history? Come on. You know, the answer. I, I don't know. Actually, Take a stab. A Halloween havoc somewhere. No, come on, man. Starcade 97 Hogan and stuff. Oh, 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 yeah. I forgot. See how it goes is when you don't hang on to your past, you sometimes forget important parts of it. The, so, yeah. the biggest WCW pay-per-view in history. And it's not close. Is sting and Hulk Hogan Starcade 97. How long did you take to tell that story? Eric year and a half, 700,000 buys. Wow. The invasion's three weeks old. 775,000 bucks. Wow. What a data point. I'm just saying like the idea is right there. Wrestling fans want it so bad. You spent a year and a dog on half telling that story and it broke every record 700,000. Meanwhile, we throw shit against the wall for three weeks. See what sticks 775,000 buys and the wheel still came wow. out. That's crazy to me, Eric, just to give it that context. And that tells you what could have been. Of course, we know WCW was largely positioned as mid Carters. No disrespect to DDP and Booker T. They are top guys. And we know Booker T had more success than anyone who made that jump from WCW, but it just didn't hit man. And by November, it's all done. It's wrapped up. And just to put it in perspective, because we did talk a lot about you know, the NWO and what could have been and how they're going to be in, in February. Let's not forget that later that same year at the end of 2001, here comes Ric Flair. They do wind up bringing Ric Flair in Ric Flair. Even if he wasn't going to wrestle could have been an incredible mouthpiece for WCW. And I would argue a much better mouthpiece and bigger piece of the show than Shane McMahon. Like let Shane do his thing. But Hey, Shane brought me in and I'm representing WCW and we're going head to head, man, as a promo, that could have been fantastic. I would have preferred you in that spot, but I'd gladly take Rick as a second spot. And of course, I, uh, I, I think Rick would have been better than me, except for the NWO part, Rick right? Not have, but just in the initial invasion, you know, especially if staying would have been the guy and had to reason and follow that up with Rick Flair and let Rick Flair be the mouthpiece of, of the invasion angle until he was forced or ready to get into the ring. That would have been pretty freaking cool too. He, Rick wouldn't have, like I said, lent himself to the NWO chapter of that invasion story. Right. But the initial part of it, he would have, and more so than me because Rick represented WCW far more than I did. I mean, for that matter, if you really want to do this invasion thing, to your point, you could have the Goldbergs and the DDPs and the stings represent the WCW side of thing with Ric Flair. You could represent, uh, the NWO side of things with hall and Nash and Hogan and whoever else you want. Uh, and then of course on the ECW side, you just have Paul Heyman and think about the promos from that group. If the mouthpieces are Vince McMahon, Ric Flair, Eric Bischoff, Paul Heyman, this thing could have been booked a million different ways. It might still be going on. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we say we don't have the budget for it. So as soon as we kill it, it finishes November at, at survivor series. The very next night, that's when we bring in Ric Flair three months later. That's when we bring in Hogan Hall and Nash a year later. That's when we bring in Goldberg. It was right there. We needed to bet on ourselves, And instead of flushing all and here's the thing i just want to add proper context for this because people always say well we didn't have it in the budget but we had plenty of budget for that piece of shit xfl like the xfl think about the massive losses the xfl took and for a fraction of that 
you could have got all the stars that you wanted here that you said you couldn't afford. And then I don't know, maybe you would have made money because you beat WCW's highest grossing pay-per-view that they spent 18 months building in three freaking weeks with candidly less than stars. Like you didn't use the top tier and it still got there. What could SummerSlam have looked like? What could Survivor Series have actually looked like had we just made that investment here and not in less than football? Because that's what it was. And I guess we'll never really know. What we do know is that uh, Eric and I start every single day with one delicious scoop of AG1. Eric, I know you believe in this product. You and Megan and, and Lori have been using this long before they were even a sponsor here on the program. At the start of the pandemic, my wife said, hey, we need to look out for our immune system's duty. You need to have a scoop of this and a, cu and a cup of water every day. And I thought, I don't know about that. And to my surprise, damn, it actually tasted pretty good. And I did notice that I had more energy, that I had more focus, that I had more clarity. That's what it does for me. Now, for my wife, she does it before she goes to work out. She feels like she's more productive. I feel like I'm more focused at work. I think it's because it provides an all-in-one nutritional platform you're going to get 75 different high quality ingredients that are going to set you up for success. It's going to help you with your digestion, with your sleep, with your recovery, with your focus, with your energy, with your strength, with your clarity. Uh, this is just checking all the boxes. I know you and Mrs. B believe in it. Tell us what you think of AG one. I'm not exaggerating. Again, take it every day. Um, even when I'm on the road, I have travel packets that I take with me. I eat pretty clean. Most of the time when I'm traveling, it's a little bit different, but when I'm home, when I say clean, I don't eat any carbs. I'm very careful that I get the right amount of nutritional fat and um, protein and things like that on a keto diet. I short story. I've kind of fine tuned my diet nutritionally to what's almost perfect for me. I also fast usually 14 to 18 hours a day. I, I fast. And as a result of that, I'm, super sensitive to food and nutrition. I can literally, if I eat certain things in the evening, I'll sit down, we'll have dinner, start watching television, whatever. And I can literally feel about a half hour, 45 minutes later when that food starts hitting my system. I know that sounds weird, but I, I call it, I tell Lori, I said, up, oh, got my food rush. Meaning when, when you're, when you're, when your metabolism is functioning, at a, at a, for me, not speaking for everybody because I don't know everybody. I'm not a doctor, nutritionist. My wife is, but I'm not. But when I'm in a really clean state and eating very smart, I literally can feel certain things hit me almost. I get a rush. Let's put it that way. Similar in a way to some other things. When I have AG1 in the morning, it takes for me about 12 minutes, and I go, oh, there it is. I already have a fair amount of energy, and, and I do other things during the day to ensure that because I, t I tend to fade out at about 4 o'clock, and I try to extend that as best I can. So I, I've got my own process for that. But when I take AG1 first thing in the morning, I feel it hit my system, and within 20 minutes after that, it actually happened on this show. I, I mean, saw this it. Morning, I'm sitting here and I'm kind of struggling through and staggering around through the open and my not quite functioning on all levels. And I really had my AG1 about 40 minutes before I hit join the, join the room, right? And while we're doing the about three or four minutes, five minutes into the open, I went, oh, there it is. <laughs> There's my baby. So I, I absolutely believe it. And for me, it allows me to think more clearly, to articulate those thoughts differently and, and better. Uh, that's what I notice, And and that's because from a functional point of view, and again, I'm not trying to pretend I'm, I'm a nutritionist, but when you have all of the, the ingredients that are in AG1 that affects your gut biome, and people don't realize that hormones are, are created first in your gut. It's a signal um, to create hormones in your brain, but that signal comes from your gut. So everything that you do throughout the day functionally depends on your, the health of your microbiomes and your gut health. That's why I believe in this thing. 
as much as I do because I can feel it. I see the difference and it just affects in a really positive way, my ability to function throughout the day. All right, Eric, let's, uh, let's do a couple quick questions. Then we'll get out of here. This is a fantastic question from Zoe Lopez. Ask Eric, if you could pick your five on five, who would be your WCW selections and your WWF selections, all of them in their prime. So let's just, rather than say in your prime, we'll call it 2001. We're going to rebook the ending here. Maybe not the ending. We're going to rebook the survivor series. Cause as you and I joked, this thing could still be going on now. Uh, but what would that look like? You're going to get five representatives from WCW and five representatives from the WWF. So there is no ECW in this 2001. Who would you pick? Sting Goldberg, DDP. Where was Eddie Guerrero in 2001? He, he was, was in a, the WWF. He was, he was, he was already there. So on the WCW Sting. side, I'd have had, I'd have had Eddie defect. Sting, Goldberg, DDP. So you're not going to do Hogan in there. Not going to do flair. No Nash no. Luger. Not to start with. Not okay. to start with. So Sting, Goldberg, DDP, somehow Eddie Guerrero. we got one more. Um, T. Scott Steiner. I'd go with Booker. Okay. So the fantasy booking here from uh, the WCW side of things for Eric Bischoff is Sting, Goldberg, DDP, Eddie Guerrero, and Booker T. Now, who are they going to be wrestling on the WWF side, Eric? Well, you'd have to go with Austin, number one. Um, yep. the, the intrigue of an, a potential Undertaker Sting matchup could be really, really fantastic. Austin and Undertaker together. Who else? Okay. Who else we got there, man? I have to I see. I have to see names on paper. I can't just pull names out of thin air. Triple H, The Rock, Kurt Angle. Oh, no. I would have held off on Rock. That's that's why I'd like, you know, you keep, keep certain powder dry because then you've got something to look forward to. So I wouldn't have put Rock in that initially. Big Show's um, there. Angle's there. Go Kurt Angle and Triple H for sure heard angle and triple H for sure. Cause angle could have really in, in triple H, obviously there could have been some great, great matchups in there. Uh, what have we got Four. Yep. We need one more. I'm, and I'm actually going to challenge you. I'm going to, I'm going to take uh, Eddie Guerrero away from me. All right. But Chris Benoit. Okay. So you're going to put Benoit on that side. Yep. All right. So we got Benoit triple H and Kurt angle. And who do you want to, who do you want to slide in that Eddie Guerrero spot? From the WCW uh, side of things, somebody who was still still active in 2001. Yeah, let me let me pull up that roster and let you know who all's over there in 2001. Um, I don't know that this one would have made sense, but Bam Bam Bigelow, Chris yeah. Canyon, Buff Bagwell. Uh, we already got Goldberg on the list. Um, Conan, Kevin, Scott Steiner, Scott Steiner, Scott Steiner. Here we go. And I guess maybe if he didn't snap his leg off, Sid could have been cool, uh, or maybe Luger, but that's what we got. So we got sting Goldberg, DDP Booker T and Scott Steiner, man, that's a fucking hell of a team there. Uh, and you still, to your point, you still have Hall and Nash and Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan in the weights. And then you've got Austin undertaker, Benoit triple H and angle. I could argue that WCW could have won that, which I guess would, uh, would be interesting. I know we know that Vince would have never allowed that to happen, but when I take a look at that, yeah, I would think WCW has got a real shot to win that. And every one of those talents makes sense from a history backstory point of view. Uh, Adam Arpin says in an invasion angle, you always have a traitor in your scenario with sting. Who would you have defect from the WWF to join sting? That's interesting. So is there somebody on the WCW side that would have, or the WWF side that would have come back over? Who would make sense? Would it be a Benoit, a Guerrero, a big show? Somebody Not big else? show. Not big show. Oh God. I don't know. I just, I, I have to think about that harder. I can't just pull names out of my hat like that. I have to think about that. Aaron wants to know besides sting and undertaker, what are the dream matches? Would you have booked? Is there like, that's the one everybody always gravitates to. Not me. I always thought Austin Goldberg, like in 98, that's what I really wanted to see. I think fans have 
really fallen in love with uh, the darker crow version of sting and him versus the undertaker really intrigues a lot of folks. Is there another quote unquote dream match you think could have been cool that we didn't get to see? Well, I, I'm with you. I, I think Austin Goldberg and Sting and Undertaker are really the only two that I throw into that dream match category. Um, that's assuming they had a good, decent story behind them. But th- those are the only two that feel like real dream matches. Like, oh, my gosh, if that would ever happen. Those are the only two. Uh, Mark Cyrus, uh, shout out to Mark. Glad to see him back on some of our live recordings. Wants to know what would have been the proper length to tell a proper invasion angle story. We know that it really gets kicked off in June and then it comes to a close in November. I mean, we saw you stretch sting and, and, and Hogan for 18 months. You got to think this one could have gone even longer, right? As we joke, this thing could still be going on. I mean, booked properly. There's just so much story there. Could have gone I hate there. to be that guy because it feels like this is, um, feeding into a narrative. I know Bruce would argue this and I know from a business sense, it doesn't make any sense, but you sort of alluded to it earlier. So Jim asks a fair question while most agree that the angle was rushed in hindsight, isn't there some chance that in the back of Vince's mind, he put vindictiveness over business and intentionally made WCW look weak. I don't think he intentionally made them look weak. I think the idea of always making certain that the WWE brand prevails and gets stronger every day by default kind of creatively craps on just about anything else. I, I don't think it's a, you know, a personal vindictiveness. I think it's just Vince McMahon's view of how to build his brand. How can you argue with him? <laughs> you can't, right? As as fans and, and, and an audience, would we have liked to have seen it differently and would it maybe have entertained us more, possibly? But on the other side of the equation, you can't argue the strength of the WWE brand and Vince McMahon's vision and execution in building it. One of the guys who did go back and forth that we haven't talked about on this show was Chris Jericho. With the benefit of hindsight, if we were booking this, fantasy booking, if you will, would you have liked to have seen him be a guy who would have defected or would you have kept him on the WWF side? Of no, I, I saw that pop up on, uh, on our chat feed here from our, uh, studio audience. And that would have been me. That would have made total sense. Especially, suggest- if he, especially if he had, but if you, if you've seen, I'm sure you have, cause it gets posted about once a year. Uh, Chris wrote a letter to me, hand, hadn't written, you know, when it was time for him to leave, thanking me for the opportunity. And hopefully we'll get a chance to work down the road together someday. It's a very nice letter. It was very, very, uh, it, it touched me. It was very classy of, of Chris, particularly under the circumstances. But to have Chris Jericho make that turn and pull that letter out, remember when I wrote this letter to you a couple of years ago? And I said, well, hopefully we'll work together someday. Today's the day. I mean, that would have been just little shit like that. It's Good television is nothing but a great, a, a bunch of great detail, little details strung together in a great way. And that would have been a, that would have been a cool opportunity. And Chris can pull it off. He's, he's the best. You got to see that match from last night as we're recording, we're recording on a Thursday morning. Uh, he wrestled commander. I know uh, you've probably not seen much commander, but man, what a talented guy. We had him at Ric Flair's last match. I first saw him on GCW and was fortunate enough to see him in some triple a shows in Mexico and my goodness, what a talent. Uh, and, and he had a hell of a match with Jericho last night, still doing his thing, man. All these years later, Chris Jericho, uh, one last suggestion that's sort of thrown up in the chat here. We haven't talked about it at all, but what a cool opportunity it would have been to introduce Ray Mysterio in the middle of all this. I mean, a guy who just set WCW on fire a few years prior, the idea that he could have been. Uh, a surprise in some of this, man, that, that leaves you a lot of opportunity. What couldn't that guy do? Right. God, see, that's what I mean. I have to look at names on papers, but how could I not have included Ray Mysterio? And I, as, as you were giving me, you know, ideas to, to choose from, I was thinking in my head, I need the old, I need an underdog. I need an underdog because they're easy to get sympathy on and get people on your side with. 
give me an underdog, give me an underdog. And then we got onto another name, but perfect, absolutely perfect. I'd have to go back and rebook my team. I'd throw Ray Mysterio on there, not only because he could just provide such a dynamic visual presence, because Ray Mysterio really did come to national prominence in WCW in the cruiserweight division. So there's a direct link to WCW and its heritage. <laughs> heritage, I guess. Um, yeah. But the, the ability to create sympathy because of he's physically an underdog. Awesome. Awesome choice. We, uh, we got to at least mention that, uh, on the other side of this invasion, I think the two biggest sort of breakout stars are Rob Van Dam and Booker T they're going to enjoy the most success. And unfortunately the person who it doesn't work out for maybe bigger than Mo bigger than all is buff Bagwell. And a lot's been written about that and said about that. Uh, I don't know that he necessarily got a fair shake. It's hard to believe that his television wrestling career started when he was so young and ended so abruptly. Do you think there's a scenario where buff Bagwell as a part of an invasion angle could have worked out? I mean, I know you weren't there. I know we don't know exactly what happened, but it just seems like, man, that was, that was a guy who was on TV for a long, long time. And then it's over. Certainly could have. I wouldn't have led with buff Bagwell by any stretch of the imagination. No disrespect to Mark. Um, but he certainly could have been on any of those rosters. We didn't, you know, I didn't name him you knowing my top five or anything like that because I was really looking for, for story potential more than anything else, but certainly Buff Bagwell could have been in any one of those positions as a performer. I, you know, it's unfortunate what happened with Mark. I think a lot of it was timing and culture. You know, we talk occasionally, I don't know if Bruce does or not, but there's a, there's a culture in WWE and it's different than the culture in was in WCW and adjusting to that culture and adjusting to what's expected of you in the ring because it was different in WWE than it was in WCW. I think if, if anything went wrong, it was probably Mark's ability to adapt quickly because Mark was just one of those guys. If he shows up at a party, he's going to show up and be the most fun at the party and make the most noise and attract the most attention. Not necessarily the best way to try to break into a company like WWE. So I think that was probably the issue. It wasn't because Mark wasn't a big enough talent or popular enough talent or good enough worker or didn't have the right look. None of those were the issues. My guess is it was just timing and failure to adapt. Well, we're going to talk about maybe the failure to adapt when we discuss in the coming weeks here on the program, the downfall of the NWO, how it got too big, when it stopped working, why WCW didn't pivot until it was too late. We'll also be talking about Sting's 1999 before you left the transformation of Hulk Hogan to Hollywood Hogan, SummerSlam 2003, your match with Shane McMahon, becoming an EVP, uh, WCW's relationship with Canada and so much more. You can get all of these shows early and ad free, even be a part of our live studio audience over at adfreeshows.com. And we recently sat down not too long ago with wildcat, Chris Harris on what was supposed to just be a one-off response to some comments that Bruce Pritchard had. Instead, it was such a moving interview. I said, man, we got to do more of this. We wound up talking for hours. I highly recommend it. We're calling it the false finish. And Eric, as you and I are recording now earlier this week, I did round two. Our second guest on false finish will be glacier. We're going to talk about how it all happened, what could have been and the behind the scenes of the creation and even his backstory with WCW, which I have to admit, I didn't know that this guy was wrestling Terry Funk and great Muda on TV in WCW in 1989. I didn't Neither know. Did I. No, I got to listen. <laughs> I didn't know that he was going to Japan and, and, and working quote unquote worked shoot fights with Billy Robinson and Lou Thez. Like what glacier, the same guy. Oh, I got to hear this. I didn't know any of this. And you won't believe all that went into the character, the rumor and innuendo about what costs what and what he's up to these days. It's all a part of false finish coming soon to adfreeshows.com. This week, I also talked about July of 1985 in Jim Crockett promotions with David Crockett. It's a fabulous series. We called the book real quick in July of 85. Here's what all was changing. We had the first ever great American bash. It was a stadium show with skydivers and fireworks and a concert from David Allen Coe 
and Ric Flair landed on the field in a helicopter for the main event. Three days later, the Rock and Roll Express make their debut and win the tag titles and immediately start headlining and selling out. And oh, by the way, they decide, hey, forget the NWA. If you want our touring champion, you want the big belt you see on TV. We've got the investment in TV. We've got the investment in this guy. You're going to have to co-promote with us. You see the seeds of them starting to break off, which ultimately led to the creation of the big gold belt and removing the NWA from that title. Because nowhere on that title does it say NWA. We'll find out a little bit about that and why. And we finished the month off with a record house at the Dorton Arena in Raleigh, North Carolina, the high water mark for the Battle of the Nature Boys. It's the biggest and most important show in Buddy Landell's uh, life. We talk about it the good, the bad, the ugly, how they started to get into the VHS program, and so much more. It's a fabulous series on ad free shows called The Book. You don't want to miss it. Speaking of ad free shows, we're not done. We're debuting a third new series called Making the Town. We're going to do a deep dive in historic wrestling venues. And we're starting with what else? The ECW Arena. If you've ever seen my podcast, you know, right behind me is one of the ECW Arena signs. I liked it so nice. I bought it twice. I have both of those signs because this is real wrestling history. Who better to talk to us about that building than the Blue Manny himself? And coming up on Tuesday, I can't believe this is real. Tomorrow, the first episode of Tuesday with the Taskmaster. It will debut exclusively on adfreeshows.com. You don't want to miss it. It's all happening at adfreeshows.com. I think it's the best value in wrestling going around. And speaking of value, we give you a lot of value if you want to advertise on this program. If you've heard our commercials, you hear us talk about some of the same sponsors week in, week out. Why is that? Well, because it really works. And if you're trying to target men that are 25 to 54 years old, there's no better place to advertise than right here with us at advertisewitheric.com. Love to have your interaction on social. We're at 83 weeks on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can watch the show and support the show for free over at 83 weeks on youtube.com. Love to have your interaction there and to have you subscribe. Lots of fun, new swag and merch available for you as well. 83 weeks, merch.com is where you can get all your hats and koozies and tank tops and everything in between. Eric, I didn't know what to expect today, but I had a blast talking about what could have been. Yeah. I typically shy away from these conversations, but this one was a fun one. So thank you very much. And thanks for everybody who joined us in the uh, live studio. Thanks for everybody hanging out and having a good time with us. If you haven't already check out adfreeshows.com and time for the debut of Tuesday with the taskmaster tomorrow on ad free shows. And we'll be back next week right here on 83 weeks with Eric Bischoff. Hey guys, need to call a quick time out here. Wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling my listeners over at OU you didn't know for a while now about all the cool things happening over at adsfreeshows.com. We recently celebrated the 25 year anniversary of the biggest nitro of all time when Goldberg faced Hollywood Hogan at the Georgia Dome. Eric, alongside the Taskmaster Kevin Sullivan and the living legend Larry Zabisco, joined Ad Free Shows members live to relive it. Yeah, well, you can't fire me now, so I'll tell you the truth. I don't think I don't think anything can beat that. That was the ultimate. I mean, they broke the decibel record. The roof blew off the place. It, it was amazing, it was totally amazing. Speaking of the Taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan joins AdFreeShows.com starting this July with a brand new mailbag series, Tuesday with the Taskmaster, answering your questions each and every week. I have over 50 years of experience in the wrestling business, and I'm happy to be on this platform with Conrad. So send in your letters. you got a question. I can go back even past 50 years, and I'm a wrestling historian. So anything you want to know, we'll try to deliver. That's just a small taste of what we got waiting for you. With four levels to choose from, see for yourself why Ads Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adsfreeshows.com.